Mm. All right, we ready? Okay. Yeah. I'd like to call tonight's um, workshop meeting to order for the Scarborough School Board for Thursday, July 30th. If I could please have tonight's attendance. Sure. Ms. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? We see her, but I think she's having a problem with her audio. So we'll go on. Mrs. Turner? Here. And Mr. Bennett? Here. All right. And if you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, moving on 4.0. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Okay, I know I don't have any and seeing that there are none, we're gonna move into public comment and before we go there, I just wanna read something really quick about public comments tonight. Um, there are two ways in which to provide them. One, you can email us at public comment at scarboroughschools.org. Um, I'll keep an eye on that email box. We have a few that have already come in today and we'll read those statements into the public record. Or for those members on the Zoom meeting, if you wanna raise your hand, we can promote you in as an attendee so that you can speak. Raising your hand is similar to lining up behind the podium at the public settings. You'll be placed into the order of your arrival in the queue. Due to recent issues in other district Zoom meetings and for security purposes, we ask that you use your legal name to be recognized for the public comments. And please also state your full name and address, including the town if you are not a Scarborough resident for our record. Each member interested in speaking is invited to comment one time for approximately three minutes, and we will do our very best to keep time consistent amongst all the participants. Please refrain from directing statements at or about individuals, and also please note the board will not be replying or responding to the comments made this evening during public comment. All right. Um, so for, again, the folks on the Zoom, if you want to raise questions or ask comments, um, raise your hand and I will bring you over. Um, right now we do have three um, comments that were sent in, so I'm gonna go ahead and read those. The first one is from Amelia Kurtz at One Howard Lane. Hello, I'll be watching this evening, eager to learn what is coming for the school year. I was hoping you could please clarify a few questions for me. Is the plan being discussed this evening, the results of the committee that was formed to consider options for the school year? Will we be able to see a copy of the plan? I couldn't find one online. And given that the public comment is prior to hearing the plan, will there be opportunities for parents and the public to weigh in on the options before a final decision is made and who ultimately will make the final decision? Um, so I'm already gonna break my first rule. And there is a copy of the plan online. If you go to the scarboroughschools.org page right on the front, there is a draft reopening school plan um, right there in the center of the page. So you could go ahead and follow along with us as we go through tonight. Um, from Heidi and Neri, and I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. Um, would it be possible to request a friend or two to go on the same days if we are following the hybrid model? I am referencing ease of childcare, transportation, pods and cohorts of remote learning that would be made easier and safer if kids were also able to be kept consistent during both in-person and remote learning. Um, and she's actually one of our nurses at the high school and a parent of a fifth grader. And lastly, Joanna Wallace has sent one in. Good afternoon. I'm submitting a public comment for July 30th school board meeting. I am hopeful Scarborough Schools will provide, will provide students with the option for a meaningful remote learning experience due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I strongly advocate the remote learning involve one or more Scarborough School teachers, providing direct instruction for remote learners in each class, grade, or subject. It is also important for teachers to check in with students or parents live at least once a day. The daily live contact between teachers and students is listed by the main um, BOE expectations for hybrid and remote learning. In addition, remote learners should be held to the same learning outcomes as in-person students 
including issuing of graded report cards. Thank you. All right. And Ashley, I've promoted you to talk. If you could take yourself off mute, you should be able to speak. Hi, good evening. Um, actually, I am a friend of Ashley's. My name is Leslie Dyer. I live at 218 Holmes Road in Scarborough. I have a first grader, third grader, and fifth grader uh, going into the Scarborough School Department. Um, my question is, I guess, you know, I'm a teacher as well in a local district, and um, I'm wondering when are we going to hear what days if we choose to go into um, yellow, what days will our children be going to school because um, I, I guess they need to hire childcare. So I'm curious on when are we going to find out when our kids are going to school and how often they're going to school um, because I know that if we keep on waiting, it's really challenging. Like I said, I'm a teacher. I'm expected to go back five days a week. Um, I don't really know who to, like, I need to find someone to take care of my children so I can go back as a teacher myself. So when are we going to hear kind of a final decision? If we're in red, here's the story. If we're in yellow, here's the story. If we're in green, this is what's going to happen. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to give it just a moment in case anyone else would like to make a public comment tonight. Denise, I've um, opened you up to speak. If you could take yourself off mute. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, Denise Blaine, I am a teacher at Scarborough Schools. Um, I've been there for about 19 years. Um, I sat on the start committee um, to, I guess, put this plan together. Um, I say that because I, I looked at the plan today and I found it um, far more detailed than um, what I left my committee with. Um, so I'm assuming there was some work done there in the process. Um, my statement tonight is, is just pretty simple. We need communication and by we, I mean staff, um, parents and the community in general. I know that this is the first time the board is seeing the plan. I know that this is the first time parents are seeing the plan. Um, I feel like communication in this whole process has um, been lacking um, and, and that's my opinion and my opinion only. Um, but I, as we move to August, um, I still don't know when I'm going to school. Um, my sister still doesn't know how she's going to have childcare. Um, I have parents emailing me about what's gonna happen um, with SATs and courses. And I just am getting really frustrated. And um, I would encourage the board and administration to put some more communication out there as, as soon as they can um, to help clarify and frankly ease anxiety and stress um, that your staff and I think your community are feeling. Um, lastly, I would just like to say publicly thank you for all your work that you did with the budget. Um, I, I know it was not easy and um, the finance committee, Sarah and um, everyone that was involved, you did an amazing job and, and thank you for what you did. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Betsy, I've promoted you. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. Um, 
Elizabeth Chalmers. I live at 17 Fairway Drive. I have a, a rising 10th grader and 12th grader at the high school. And I was a member of the task force, uh, mostly working with the nine to 12 academic team. Um, and I apologize, but I haven't read the plan that got posted yet. Uh, but I just wanted to advocate for some more time for uh, teachers and staff to plan. I think that they're going to have to be, we're, we're all gonna have to be ready to switch from red to yellow to green and back again, potentially. And knowing that there will probably be students who are learning from home entirely, that parents may choose that route for their kids. Uh, and I think that our staff needs more time to collaborate and to plan and to learn how to use some of the tools that are available to them. Uh, and so I'd like to advocate for the start day for students to be pushed back. And I don't know if that was uh, brought forward in the plan or not, uh, just from a parent perspective. I think we all want our students to get more out of school when it starts up again in the fall. Uh, we know that the spring plan was just sort of a stopgap for finishing out the year, um, but we want uh, our students to learn the best that they can under the circumstances. And I think that our staff really needs time to plan that well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we did receive another public comment from Courtney Graffis, who lives in Portland and is a school employee. I'm wondering if outdoor learning has been considered for Scarborough schools in order to decrease indoor exposure to one another. I'm also wondering if it is possible to consider a Monday, Thursday, and a Tuesday, Friday hybrid model to allow students to have in-person instruction throughout the week rather than two days in a row. Thank you very much, Courtney. Okay, I'm gonna give it one more minute in case anyone else would like to speak. All right, um, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comments. Thank you. And then moving into the workshop portion for um, the opening plan of the School Transition Reopen Redesign Task Force. Okay, so thank you very much. This is Superintendent Prince here and we're talking about the reopening plan. Um, I just like to preface, I uh, thank you for your patience across the state of Maine. Uh, obviously, every district is reopening their plans and talking about them. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And um, tonight, we have the affordability to share with you our best thinking at this time. And I would also like to acknowledge the school transition reopening redesign task force their task was to review the most current directives and recommendations from the main department of ed and CDC to consider input from the public health officials, including the district physician and public safety, and to develop a plan to present to the school board inclusive of the following elements, physical reentry needs and protocols, health and wellness needs and protocols, academic planning, and social emotional wellness plan. Next slide, if possible. This team met four times in June. There were four committees with 90 participants, people from the health, operations, academics, social emotional wellness, and pretty much everybody, all 90 participants lived in Scarborough for the most part. We configured three plans for learning, a remote, a hybrid, and an in-person. Planning in line with the current Department of Ed and CDC guidelines. In June, surveys went to students, families, and staff, and in July, surveys to families and staff. And we appreciate the feedback we had a great response and it really helped drive our plan that we're proposing tonight. Requirements from DOE and CDC, students and staff will be required to wear face coverings in all areas of the school. That does include buses, in group restrooms, 
and when traveling, traveling in the hallways and in classrooms. You've heard a lot about physical distancing and the requirement for that is three to six feet for students. So when students are walking down the hallway or wherever, they need to be three to six feet apart. And everybody must conduct a daily self-check for symptoms to make sure that we're on top of this and we're looking at prevention. So that self-check is really important as well. Some requirements, protocols for return to school after illness. We have protocols, again, that the committee worked on and uh, it's all set to go. We have access to additional safety materials as needed, like shields, gloves, and gowns. And we also will be requiring for people to increase their hand hygiene, and we'll have training and protocols for that as well. I'm going to turn this over to Diane. So the next slide um, is a description of um, the three models that um, our district, just like every other district in the state, was asked to create. Um, this is the same uh, or similar to the stoplight that I've been talking with you about um, since uh, this has started. And so um, in level one is remote learning. That would be if all instruction was remote um, and uh, that would be because the governor would have issued a stay at home order um, or the Department of Education and the CDC are recommending a school to be closed. Um, during level one, only essential workers are allowed at school and instruction is remote and every building would have uh, specific remote learning protocols and procedures. So this is just the broad overview and then we're gonna dig in um, as the presentation continues. Level two is hybrid. Um, if there is minimal or moderate spread um, where we live and that is a combination of both remote instruction and in-person instruction. Um, and if we were in the yellow, um, that would be uh, because the governor has modified the stay at home order um, and has allowed for in-person school if the conditions that Sandy just spoke about are met. Um, those are requirements, those are not choices, those six things that he talked about. Um, if the CDC recommends three to six feet of social distancing within classroom settings, which is the case right now, again, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that um, you know, that we're working on a moving target. And so recommendations are fluid, um, but um, considering that recommendation um, in order to meet that requirement, groups of students would alternate between in-person days of learning and synchronous remote days of learning. Um, and, and the purpose of that really is to limit the number of students um, in the building at any one time so that we reduce the risk to the greatest degree possible. Um, and as distancing and safety requirements might be relaxed, so for example, if the three to six foot requirement um, was lifted, then uh, we would be able to reconsider our plan and move towards 100% um, of K to five students attending in person full time. Um, and that really is based upon the science that shows that uh, our younger students are uh, less affected, uh, whereas our older students uh, are uh, more <coughs> like adults in terms of um, how they are at risk. In level three, in person, um, that would be if it is determined that there is low or no spread of COVID-19 and in green, all students would be attending school. Uh, that also means that there's no stay at home order and that the restrictions on school activities and gatherings would be limited. Although students would all be in school, 
we might still be required to employ specific procedures because throughout all of this process, um, we will be required to follow any state or CDC mandates. Um, and so uh, that may uh, also limit some activities that students are able to do in order to reduce, reduce the risk of exposure. And again, really making sure that we're following the requirements. Um, so all of these talk about, all of these hinge on this red, yellow, and green metric. And so um, as we think about where we see our district or, or even schools, there are many factors that are considered that in making those determinations. Um, the first is local case information. So for example, um, if, if there were some cases that were specific here in Scarborough, even though Cumberland County might be in the yellow, we might decide that we need to be in the red or the CDC might tell us that our specific community needs to be in the red. And so there is that local case information. There's also the biweekly metric um, that the main department of education um, and the governor's office is putting out. Um, those metrics are going to be posted on the main DOE website um, every two weeks. The first metric is going to be posted tomorrow. Um, I believe the governor might be holding a press conference since this is the first release of the metric tomorrow afternoon. Um, so that's going to be another piece of information for us. And then obviously, as I've already stated, the CDC recommendation. Um, and again, we're going into all of this understanding that there may be the need for us to flex between levels um, dependent on changing conditions during the 2020-2021 school year. And that's why we've been very thoughtful in coming up with um, the plan that you're going to see unveiled tonight. I think that's my cue. Let me walk you through the hybrid model because that is the model that our leadership council spent uh, quite a bit of time discussing. Um, we began that process by doing a deep study of all of the recommendations made by each of the four subcommittees from the start team. We wanted to honor all as many of the recommendations as we possibly could in putting a design together that would work well for our students, our families, and our staff. So this hybrid model entails <clears throat> taking the student population of each school and dividing it into two cohort groups. So half of the students, for example, on Monday and Tuesday in cohort A, they would be on site in the school. They would be practicing those safety measures, but they would be attending, physically attending school on Monday and Tuesday. They would then be remote on Thursday and Friday. So the remote learning, the other half of the school population, cohort B, would be involved in remote learning during that day on Monday. We also, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in future slides, but we will be offering, it was important to the START committee that families have a choice, a remote option, and we want to honor that. So there will be a group of students whose families choose for them to do their learning remotely throughout the year. There's also a group of students who based on their needs will need to be in school every day. So our school schedules across K-12 will be Monday and Tuesday cohort A on site. Wednesday is a little different. Wednesday for three hours in the morning Groups A, B, and C will be learning. They'll be continuing their learning on Wednesday morning remotely. Those students in cohort D will still come to school for the half day. Thursday and Friday, cohort B will be on site in the schools and cohort A will be learning remotely. Wednesday afternoon is the time when staff 
will be involved in PD and planning to provide that continuity and the equity across their learning, the students learning, whether in school or remote. So please note that as we put these designs together, we were really aimed at providing as much consistency for families and students as possible while maintaining and honoring the safety recommendations as well. In terms of the time, the expected time for a school day, we wanted the group wanted to stay as close to our traditional times and schedules as possible. So across all schools, the expectation, whether in person or remote, is that students would be involved in a full day of learning. Please note that in terms of these times, depending on the choices and the transportation, um, these are target times. For example, if a large number of uh, families at Wentworth School decide they want to drop off their children, we will need to make, may need to make some accommodations in terms of drop-offs and pickups in order to be as efficient as possible. Also in terms of transportation and runs and bus runs, we'll need to also figure out those so that we have the most effective uh, system. There is much discussion about how we're going to identify each of the cohort groups uh, because as was stated earlier, uh, many families would be need that information to provide daycare and to begin to set their schedules. We wish we could give that to you two weeks ago, um, but we are working as hard as we can. We're running different models. Um, and Dawn may be able to speak a little bit more about that. Our IT team is running different models by school and then looking to honor and to preserve family ske schedules. That was a very strong recommendation from the START team committee was that um, because we're running two separate schedules that families needed to be on the same schedule. Also note in terms of scheduling for the school day that we are not talking about a remote day where students are latched onto their computers the entire time. Uh, you'll notice I'll talk a little bit in the academic uh, recommendations that there be a balance of online and offline. This is particularly important for K-5. Um, we do, we heard the recommendation loud and clear from the survey data that there needs to be more synchronous live teacher-student interaction time. And we're going to look to maximize that, but it would not be full day with students sitting, staring at screens all day. Um, so we are going to commit to dedicated time for that and the building principals are beginning to work on what that might look like. While the, um, most of our time was spent on the hybrid, I'd like to talk a little bit about the red remote learning <clears throat> model. Um, the schedule, the daily schedule would stay the same. In essence, because we're offering a remote option, we really do need to be thinking and planning for a rigorous remote learning experience for all students. Should we need to move into the red remote learning? The, there's that consistency of the same schedule for all students. And again, K-5 would have a dedicated time for that synchronous learning, and 612 would follow, even in red, would follow their regular course schedules and attend classes remotely. We will, similar to last spring, deploy school, school devices for all students, uh, including earbuds, and we will work to support everyone in terms of providing the connectivity that is needed. So the green in person, which is um, probably the days we long for um, pre-COVID, um, but the green in person should those safety um, protocols um, and requirements um, uh, <clears throat> become a little looser, we will be able to have all students on site daily. Please note that as we've been working with our area colleagues and area districts, every school district has a different set of constraints that it's working from. So you may hear about how Biddeford or Yarmouth or Falmouth is doing things for their elementary students or for their middle school students, but they have very different, just like we have very different sets of facilities with our district, 
So we really took a look and safety first uh, and took a look at our facilities to ensure um, that we maintain um, as best we can for students um, all the safety measures that we need to put in place for them as well as for staff and the operations folks um, and the safety folks will talk a little bit more about that as well. So the full remote option, um, the START team was um, <clears throat> in full support of offering this option and our survey data, we have a sense of those folks uh, who would like their students to stay home and access the remote option. So during the week of August 3rd, we're going to survey families where they can will be asked whether or not they want um, to send their children and it um, or each child what their learning preference or their learning model preference is for each child in their family. Please know that we want to be as flexible as possible um, and we will um, folks who select this option, we will they will have an opportunity to rethink that option every marking period. We want to get that information in as soon as we possibly can so that we can complete the process at identifying the cohort group so we can get that information out to families as quickly as possible. I believe this is the opportunity for questions at this point in time. Before we get into questions, just as a reminder, this is the introduction. We still have four discrete sections in which we'll describe in greater detail um, the work of the academic group, the health group, the operations group, and the social emotional recommendations as well. So, um, you know, if you have specific questions in any of those four areas, um, we are going to be providing more than you've seen to, to this point. Um, before I open it up to questions from the board, I did get two more um, emails just as we were closing out public comment, and I didn't want to interrupt the beginning of the presentation. Um, the first is from Kate Swinburne, um, parent and a teacher in the district. Thank you for all your hard work on coming up with a plan for getting back to school. As a teacher in the district and, as, and a parent, I'm wondering what is the start date at this point? Thinking as a teacher, we need, we need more time to plan and learn new protocols. As a parent, I am thinking I'm going to need more time to finalize plans when I am teaching and my kids are at home. And from William Cabana, um, he teaches sixth grade at Scarborough Middle School. First and foremost, I wanna thank everyone for their work on the reopening committees this summer. I'm seeking some clarification on the level to yellow hybrid plan for grades 6 through 12. It states that students will follow regular class schedule and attend classes remotely. Does this imply that teachers at these phase levels will be instructing students in person and remotely at the same time? If so, some additional information about how this would look across different phase levels would be useful as it greatly impacts how our classrooms will look upon return and could present some unique challenges with teaching strategies and class management. Thank you. All right. Hillary, you are first up. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, and actually, that question from Will actually is very similar to my question. My, um, I'm wondering if um, cohort A is in person on Monday and Tuesday and cohort B is um, involved in remote learning, is that same teacher expected to do both of those at the same time? Depends on the phase level and the teaming and the structure. The intent is to provide a similar uh, experience for all students. And that's the piece where we need the extra time to work with our teachers um, to do that. Uh, we do want to try to put cohorts and pods, I think the term now is pods together or teams of teachers so that they can work together. One teacher would maybe monitoring and providing the lesson to those on site, but also displaying through um, a camera the lesson to the students at home and there would be an assignment or a learning activity provided the students in class may be working on one at learning activity and the students may be working in a different way, but on the same learning activity as much as possible. 
Okay, so um, so you're so I just I had concerns about one teacher being responsible for both in-person learning and remote learning at the same time, and you're saying that that will not be the case. That that may be the case depending on the skill set of the teacher. That may be the case depending on the situation and the course. What we're trying to do is figure out. Um, what those teamings might look like so that one teacher or an ed tech may be helping to monitor those who are on site while the teacher in person is working with those students in class. So we're going to try, we're trying to make it as equitable as possible for all students. Um, and in this way, um, we would be able to engage students in learning if we split the two groups and basically we're doing a half year for one group and a half year for another, it is a model and a way in which we can um, accelerate and scaffold the learning for students. Okay. Um, I've got a quick one. Hillary, thank you. I had that same question. And I'm wondering, how are we going to manage um, concerns with the remote learners and not seeing other students in the classroom due to um, maybe FERPA, bio, you know, FERPA concerns or if their parents have not signed off on them being um, videoed or um, photoed? In terms of FERPA, FERPA is really about educational record. It's less about whether or not students see each other learning because on site on a normal traditional school schedule, students see each other learning. It's really about the recording and what we do with that educational record. We will need to set expectations. We will need to communicate with parents about what the expectations are with live virtual meetings. Uh, and we will need to work with students about what those and help them set those routines and expectations when we're in a remote environment. Just like you're building classroom routines and expectations within a classroom in the fall. Um, we will need to have some sign offs on some pieces. We are not recommending recording any of these instructional sessions if it involves students or student responses. So we're also looking at different models where sometimes maybe what is displayed is a recorded piece so students can then access it or either using backgrounds or camera angles not to record the students while doing the live instruction. Thank you. Max? Um, I just had a question regarding like the changing of the colors. I know you had mentioned that we would probably end up going like from red or to yellow or to green at different points within this uh, the fall semester. And I was wondering like, am I, if I'm in group B and I wake up on Thursday morning and we're in the red and like we were doing yellow beforehand, am I just gonna like not go to school that day? Like how often is this expected to change? I know you had mentioned like every two weeks the metric would come out, is that, like, are we taking what our schedule is on a biweekly basis? I just want to know what that looks like. Uh, my understanding is that those metrics will come out every two weeks. So we have two metrics to view before the start of our school year. But as uh, Diane shared, that it also depends on our local situation. Um, we're trying to figure out how we might do that. There is additional guidance that is supposed to be coming to us. Diane, you want to speak to that? That would be wonderful. Yeah, I was just going to add in that, um, you know, those metrics or the local situations that Monique talked about are going to influence ultimately the superintendent's decision um, to call school, right? So uh, if you think about it, uh, kind of like uh, an emergent situation, right? So if we're in the yellow and a set of circumstance happens that we need to go in the red, um, that will ultimately be Superintendent Prince's decision to, um, to move us into that. Um, and again, what we're trying to do is to set up these systems so that if we did need to move into red, uh, we wouldn't have to have a, a week off from school like had to happen in the spring because we were starting everything from scratch. 
Sandy, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, it's it probably be very similar to like a snow day. So we would make sure that we do an all call. We would put it on our website, email, um, and we would communicate that as soon as we get an indicator that we have changed um, from like yellow to green or yellow to red. So it will be important for us to do that. And I would suspect that you would have a far, uh, over the weekend, I would expect that you would get a call about the change. Because again, every two weeks on a Friday, the commissioner will come out with uh, any changes. So I appreciate that uh, input and question, and we will make sure that we communicate that. Awesome. I just envision like people getting really frustrated with a constantly shifting schedule, which I know you guys have no control over. And I know that we can't control what color we are. That's just like a concern that I think we would have to face at some point. The other piece that I would just add, Max, is like those metrics come out bi-weekly, but even if there is a small shift in the metric, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're changing what we're doing. It informs our practice, but it doesn't dictate our practice. So we're not necessarily anticipating every two weeks um, here's what we're doing for these two weeks. Here's what we're doing for those two weeks. We're really anticipating, um, you know, starting at a point and, um, and probably staying in that point unless local conditions really, um, you know, change to the positive or negative. Nick? Yeah, actually, my question is, almost identical to Max's. And so the only thing I want, I'm gonna add is just basically to say that as I was thinking about this, looking at the, at the our plan, but also looking on the state website, I was thinking that obviously coming down the stoplight is more serious than going up. In other words, going from green to yellow or yellow to red is something that really requires an immediate response. Whereas if you're going the other way, you have a little more, you would seem to have a little more flexibility as to how urgent that has to be. And that speaks to exactly what you just said, Diane, that, you know, I think it's gonna be really important for us to, to try and obviously get as much in-person learning for our students as is safe, but also to do so in a way that is limited, that limits the disruption to our families. And so to Max's point, you know, every two weeks on Friday, it would be like a game show. If all of a sudden it was like, what color are you this week? And I, I mean, that would be really intense for our families. And so I'm glad to hear that. And that's the way I read it too, Diane, that, you know, it, it guides our practice. It doesn't dictate our practice, which is the perfect way to put it. So thank you for saying that. You're welcome. Okay. Alicia. Thank you. I have um, two questions. One is um, the description of the yellow um, hybrid version indicates that as soon as it seems feasible, we would move um, K5 into um, fully in-person instruction and wondering if that means necessarily that 612 will only occur when we're in green. And um, my second question is, who is going to be making the determination of um, the qualifications for students to fall in, in the group D, which will qualify for fully um, uh, in-person instruction if that's going to be administration and if parents will have um, input into that as they will with the remote version, because it seems as though there will be some limitations. And I'm just wondering when we talk about equity, um, who's, what, what the qualifications will be um, and, and who will be assessing that and if there's an appeal um, process or, or, or what that will look like. So not having done this before, um, it's a great question, but I would, I typically uh, work with my administrator team to make a decision. I would not do this alone. Um, I, I think it could get a little uh, challenging to try to seek input from the public about whether or not uh, we should change our course from like green to yellow or whatever. I would look at this, Alicia, as a, a way to pull in 
my key administrators probably here at central office and look at the data and make a decision. That's my best thinking at this point in time. Well, I, I, maybe I wasn't, um, uh, didn't describe it well, Sandy. I, what I meant was um, there's this group D of, of students who will qualify for fully in-person instruction. And, and my question was who, who decides what the qualifications are to, to um, become part of that cohort group? And, and what are they? I'm wondering if Chris Rohde, um, who's our Assistant Special Services Director, might be able to speak to that question. Chris, you're on, right? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Sure. So, uh, you know, certainly one group that we'd be looking at very closely would be um, for Group D would be students with IEPs. And what Allison Marchese, the director, and I have been looking at is uh, trying to figure out how many of those students we can get in for four days a week. And there's a couple of factors driving that. Uh, the first would be that, um, you know, we want to try to uh, stay in compliance with student IEPs, even given our adjusted schedule to make sure that our students with disabilities are getting um, the service time that they're entitled to through their IEPs. And also that we're providing instruction that allows students to make uh, meaningful gains towards the goals in their IEP. So at this point, Point, I would say, you know, we're not sure how many students with IEPs we'll be able to have in that group D, um, but certainly our goal is to have as many students as possible. And um, that work will uh, be done once we know a little bit more about the building schedules and uh, we've been looking at the size of classrooms and, and those pieces. So, so Alicia, that, that is certainly like one, one group of students that we're hoping to include as many of them as we can um, in that group D. Thank you. And then, and then I was wondering if somebody could answer the question about the um, six through twelve. Um, what, what if if their return to school will occur in the yellow or only if in the green? So up to this point, um, that it, it's written with that qualifier because again, um, that's linked to the science and also to some of the recommendations from the DOE to this point. So, you know, again, um, we are gonna continuously loop back to what is the science saying about the level of safety um, for students to return. And we're also going to link back to what are the recommendations from our Department of Education and from the CDC. Great, thank you. Kristen? Yeah, I had a question about if we do move from yellow to green and parents, if they have opted in to do the two days in, but then we switch to green and at that point they would like to switch to remote, will they have that choice? If they're not comfortable with the full five days in whatever the new safety requirements are in the green, can they switch at that point? So that's a great question and one that we haven't really discussed yet. So I'm going to add it to our list. Okay, thank you. Sarah? Uh, thanks, Leanne. Um, you guys may, Diane, you may be getting to this. So if you, you are, you can just table it. But um, I guess my question is just around what happens regardless of what color, what phase we're in. Well, I guess yellow or green if a student is test positive or a family member of a student test positive, what's our plan? How do we, where do we go from there? Do we automatically move into red? Does just that classroom or that pod or cohort move into red? And so how do, how do we go about handling that? So I do think that we're gonna get into that a little bit more during the health section. So if we could put that okay. on for a few minutes. Thank you. Yep, that's fine. And then, yeah, no worries. And then I guess, um, maybe Monique, just to follow up to Hil Hillary's question. I'm sure there was a lot of conversation and, and sort of analysis done on the different options for learning at the same time. Um, I guess I would just be curious to know a little bit more about the option to, um, to not do synchronous learning. So in, in other cases, have your pod and, and you have a teacher 
you know, teaching remote and she kind of moves, he or she moves with the classroom. So they're remote one day and then they're in person the next, but not doing both at the same time. Um, I don't actually know if we have enough staff to do that, um, but I'm just curious sort of if that was part of the discussion and why that was, um, you know, ruled out if it was. Yes, we did have a conversation around that. We are quite fortunate in Scarborough that we have within our campus uh, sufficient bandwidth to be able to provide live synchronous instruction um, as well as asynchronous instruction. We heard very clearly from the community, both in survey data and from the participants on the START team, that they wanted more rigorous uh, live synchronous instruction. Uh, and if it is going to be rigorous, um, if you're doing one day, a teacher is doing instruction to half their group one day and then half their group the other day, you're talking about a half a year of learning. Uh, and so the opportunity to have and work with those students, and this is where we're still working out, and the building principals who are the experts in making very large, complex buildings work incredibly well, are still working on the details of staffing and the configurations and how that might work. I'm in the process of researching professional development to help support teachers. Many teachers have very creative ideas that they want to do and try and work on as a result of what they've learned from uh, this past spring's experience. So we're still in the process of developing some of those models to help support teachers, but we felt that it made the most sense and it was in response to what we heard our community asking for as a result of their experience from last spring. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but before I do, um, there is a hand up in the public um, where this is, we had public comment initially. If you've got questions, if you could please email those to the board at boe at scarboroughschools.org, we'll make sure that those get addressed. Um, or forwarded to the proper place to be um, answered. So I've got a couple of um, different ones. You had touched a bit, Monique, about um, making sure that students had adequate Wi-Fi. Um, what would happen if a home did not have adequate support currently for um, multiple students to be synchronous learning, where you're going to try to keep families on the same schedule and their parents working at the same time? Um, you know, again, not to tell too many stories, but I had to ban somebody from gaming tonight to ensure that I stayed on the Wi-Fi. Um, how are we going to support that and not um, negatively impact the student as we uncover these issues? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to rely on my colleague Don to respond to that because he's been put, he and his team have been putting quite a bit of time into problem solving that and securing um, supports um, for our families. So uh, specifically to that question, because we anticipated it um, last spring, we um, acquired, uh, started the process of acquiring um, hotspots for families and for a small number of families that came to us, uh, we issued them out uh, as well as some staff. Um, and what we planned on doing is uh, continuing that practice and expanding it on an as needed basis. Uh, specifically, uh, what that is, is a, it's a Verizon hotspot, like you would get if you went into the Verizon store. Um, and rather than tethering it to a phone or anything else, um, this little hotspot can sit in a window or whatever, and you connect your school-issued device to it, and that's how you get your bandwidth uh, connection to the internet. It's a cellular Wi-Fi device. We, would, we plan on um, creating a, a quick process by which families could come to us, communicate the, the need the, that they have, and then we could um, document that and provide them with the, with the appropriate tool. Great, thank you. And I think my next questions are probably to you as well, Don. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to like video um, monitor training, teaching students how to make sure that they're looking away and 
um, not staring at the screen consistently. Will we be offering some of that education to families and students, um, especially 612, where they're expected to be on their computers pretty consistently throughout the day? Well, um, I'll start with uh, referencing back to a comment um, that Monique made in, in her previous uh, presentation that uh, we are going to work with teachers to, to try to emphasize um, the synchronous and asynchronous portions of the teaching and learning that, um, that we believe we got a lot of good feedback um, from parents and teachers uh, and on our start committee. We need to focus on more synchronous opportunity, but that doesn't mean that we need to have people streaming back and forth for six, eight hours a day. Um, and certainly we can um, provide some uh, tips and guides to uh, families on things like just basic posture, um, ideas that they might employ in their house to um, for students to be comfortable um, while they're working. Um, just basic things like uh, try not to do it in the middle of the living room with everyone zipping back and forth and the TVs on and everything else. Doesn't mean that the that our students may necessarily follow through with that, but definitely we can um, provide some uh, some tips for them and and hopefully they'll be helpful for them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I have one more question, and that had to do, we've talked, you mentioned, Chris, about the um, IEPs. What are we going to do to support the 504 plans? If there is, um, you know, maybe somebody has preferential seating or they have redirections with their teacher in a quiet one-on-one -on -one basis, they're probably not going to be able to go up and ask those quiet questions in the midst of a class any longer. Yeah, great question, Leanne, and I think the answer to that is going to uh, depend on um, the individual needs of each student, and those uh, decisions would be made um, typically at a, at a Section 504 meeting where the parents would have an opportunity to participate. We'd have uh, an administrator and teachers at the table as well. You know, I would guess that um, there will be some pretty common adjustments we might need to make for things like that. So we may need to do, we may be able to do some of those without having a formal meeting with everybody at the table if all the parties agree to make a change to a 504 plan. Um, and that can happen pretty quickly. So um, that's, I think, how we would address those issues. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Hillary? Um, so I have a question um, just based on what. Um, Diane was saying about um, the possibility of K-5 students um, returning before other students because of the science of younger children. Um, I mean, there, there is some indication that younger children aren't carriers as much as we thought they might be. Um, but those schools are full of adults. So I guess I have some concerns um, about all of those adults, especially Wentworth, which is a, such a um, much larger school. Um, that's certainly more than 50 adults. And again, we wouldn't be making those recommendations unless um, the DOE or the CDC was letting us know that it um, was safe for us to do that. Okay, so, but, but I guess my question is, if it's safe for K-5 to do that, why isn't it safe for 612? Since, just because the increased population? Because I just am concerned that, I, I mean, obviously student safety is of the utmost priority, but you know, there's a lot of adults that work in our district and I, you know, I think we, that their safety is also a top priority. Um, and then I have another question. Um, is it possible that, I think this kind of relates to maybe, I forget somebody was saying it, but um, if there is a case in, a, I think Sarah, if there is a case in a specific school or classroom, um, is it possible that one school could be remote learning and while other schools in the district could still be at yellow? Yes, absolutely. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks, Hal. Kristen? Yeah, I had a question about the 
length of the school day. I'm assuming that those three hours on the Wednesday that satisfies a full day, a school day for students, correct? Yep, and then I, and I don't know if this will come up farther down the road. I do have some concerns about the length of the day for the K-5 students, just given the new requirements that they're gonna have to follow the mask wearing, revised recess, whatever that may look like. I just wonder if they have the stamina to do that for a full day. And if there's any flexibility there to maybe shorten that up some. So it's just more of a thought, I guess it's not so much a question. I can, um, you know, as the principals have begun working on what that day might look like, they are very um, careful um, in their planning to ensure that students are comfortable and um, uh, are doing what they are developmentally equipped to do and not nothing more. Um, if, for example, in terms of wearing masks all day, and you'll hear more about this um, a little later, is that there are required mask breaks. Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of things that are going to be put in place so that students are as comfortable as possible uh, so that the learning can occur at a developmentally appropriate level. And um, I would um, ask one of my colleagues at K2 if you'd like to speak some more or elaborate on that. I would just add that in terms of the length of the school day, we are bound by minimum instructional day um, requirements. Um, and should that shift for different populations of students, we would certainly consider that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hill, your hand is up. Did you have another question or? Okay. All right. I think we're ready for the next section. Okay. So uh, the next section is mine. And um, I was one of the members of the uh, health committee, along with uh, Ann Lovejoy, some of our staff, our nurses, uh, a couple of great high school students and some parents as well. And uh, these are just uh, a couple of the key findings that we had from our committee. Obviously, there's a lot more detail and a lot more work that was done, but this is just a quick overview. So first and foremost, number one bullet is um, following any and all CDC and Department of Education recommendations for safety. We talked about that a little bit tonight. Um, one uh, thing I would add to that, we just talked a minute ago about mask use being required throughout the school day. Um, as Monique mentioned a minute ago, part of that guidance also calls for students to have mask breaks during the day. <clears throat> and the guidance around that is that um, students should be at least six feet apart and either outside or preferably outside, but if we can't do that, they would need to be inside a room with the windows open. So certainly mask breaks would be a part of, of those CDC and Department of Ed recommendations. Um, for a hybrid model, like we're talking about tonight, um, our recommendation was to have Wednesday be um, a day in the middle where we can do a deep clean. Uh, we talked a lot in our committee about the importance of regular ongoing communication uh, with students and the community and families around mask wearing, how to do that properly, hand hygiene, physical distancing, uh, the screening questions. Uh, we talked about that as uh, something we'll want to be doing leading up to the opening of school, but also ongoing after we open school to make sure that we're maintaining fidelity um, with those practices. Um, we really need some clear guidelines that describe when students and staff would be sent home if they're showing signs of illness at school. And then, um, let's see, my uh, window is blocking the second column here, there we go. Uh, we talked also about students. Um, our high school students came up with this idea, which I thought was great. Um, students producing some communications to share with other students around the expectations of safety protocols. Talked a lot about the limited movement of groups through the building. And we also talked about for staff, um, making sure that we have common areas, um, as well as for students uh, that we're monitoring and making sure we're not having too many people in those areas. And also thinking about creative ways to make sure that staff can stay connected with other staff um, while we're in this model. And then finally, another issue that we talked about are were some curriculum issues. So um, there's recommendations out there around um, band, chorus, music, and possibly some PE activities that we would need to modify to be able to do those safely. And that's uh, 
yeah, just a quick overview of the work that we did. All right, I'm gonna jump in on the band one right away. Um, and I mean this, I'm gonna ask nicely. If it is not going to be offered, will parents know this ahead of time so that, you know, again, personally speaking, it's his last year. He could take something, a different elective outside of band if there isn't going to be instruction. When will we know for sure? Great question, and um, I might defer to maybe Sue on that in terms of looking at, at uh, or Kathy at the middle school in terms of looking at what the schedule looks like. But the issue driving that at the end was um, uh, just about how the virus is transmitted, and there's been a lot of studies out there about coral groups, for example, uh, mm -hmm. starting a spread, and obviously with uh, a wind instrument, a concern with that as well. So I think the challenge here will be to find ways to um, still have kids be able to participate in those activities, but what that will look like, we'll have to, we'll have to do some work around that. Um, and one of our high school students, I think, was a, a chorus member as well, and shared some thoughts about that uh, as well. But in terms of the timeline, that, I'm, not, I'm not totally clear on that. And I, can, I can I, tell you, Leanne, that I have a meeting scheduled with Mrs. Richardson, the department head for music, next Friday, and um, we'll probably begin to peel that onion on Friday. Okay, thank and you. Then, um, guidance counselor, um, let me just say that guidance counselors will be in um, a little bit early. Um, they have 10 extra days in the summer. They use three in June and will be back seven days. And I know that their primary focus will be updating schedules and taking care, reaching out to kids and taking care of that um, starting probably about August 17th. Okay. So there would be time to make um, updates on schedules if they needed to. And Great. Then, Leanne, we are planning on continuing band at the middle school. I've been in conversations with Ms. C. Um, Shvo, the mu uh, band teacher, and she can just even do keying with the students when they are in class, where they're actually not playing the instrument, but working on their keystrokes then on their remote time at home, they can play and practice. And when we were in remote learning, they would play pieces and then submit the music to her. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, Chris, I have another question that, please don't laugh at this. All of the um, things that we saw in the plan talked about with lunches, um, how they were gonna order lunches and how they would be wrapped. Can students bring their lunches from home or are we expecting that everything is gonna be on site? Uh, I'm not gonna laugh at that question because I hadn't even thought of that myself. Um, that's a great question and I'm not sure uh, what the answer to that is, Leanne. That's not something I, I don't think that came up in our group that I can remember and it, it wasn't one of our recommendations. The recommendations were more around the spacing while students are eating. Um, it's like Ann wants to weigh in. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say it, it wasn't about lunch food coming into the building. It was about the aerosolization, I believe is the word, of while you're eating. So it's about where you're eating lunch and how far apart you're distanced while eating lunch, not where your lunch is coming from. We won't be having salad bars and things where kids are going to be breathing on food or, you know, having a lot of contact with the food. Lunches will be sort of prepackaged and, and bag lunch kind of thing or wrapped up on a tray so that it's sanitary and deliver to kids if they're eating in their rooms or easy to to um, sort of hand out and serve to kids if they're spaced in a in a larger in a larger room but but adequately spaced out in a cafeteria does that make sense sort of um I, i'm getting the how we will handle what's on campus it really is coming down to because if I can't bring my um, grocery bags to the grocery store, can we bring a lunchbox from home? I think bringing a lunchbox is fine because you're gonna, your child will keep it self-contained in their backpack or with their things, and they're gonna be the only ones touching it and that kind of thing. So it's, um, I think when we look at the elementary K-5 level, kids will be keeping their 
their items close by them all day long in their home rooms and not needing to go to lockers and things like that. So yeah, bringing your lunchbox from home will be fine because it's going to be contained in your little personal bubble in your classroom. And we can have our food services director check in because again, at the state level, they're having many, many meetings uh, specific to nutrition. Great. Hillary. Um, so I have, um, I, I was just wondering if there were, was any discussion regarding um, s specialist teachers who may have contact with like many times more students than a classroom teacher or um, an ed tech that's assigned to a specific classroom? I can start that out and then turn it over to the principals for some specific um, examples. Uh, while we want our students to have all of the specials that they usually get, we're looking at how we might deliver those differently uh, and where the teacher might move to the classroom, but also we're also looking at why um, uh, uh, the possibility of having some specials take place during certain semesters um, <clears throat> or during certain trimesters. Uh, so we're looking at that a little bit differently and when they are not um, delivering instruction to the students they are assigned during that trimester. They may be helping out with some other with some classroom teachers. Um, is there building principals who would like to share some initial ideas? Um, this is still in the process of discussion um, while they're trying to work on developing their school schedules that'll work. I can jump in. So Hillary, on some days, students in, in the middle school were on a four day rotation. They might have um, digital literacy, world language and digital citizenship. And so what we do instead of having those on a rotating four day schedule, they would have one per quarter. So one of the things we found in remote learning that it was difficult for students to navigate all of the courses in their Google Classroom um, remotely. So if we can reduce the number of um, Encore classes that they have at any one time, we're reducing the amount of teachers that they see and the amount of students that each teacher has. So we've been working on changing our schedule. Okay. Um I also have, sorry, did Ann want to say something? I was just going to offer that the K-5 um, leadership has talked about having a similar um, rotation of maybe having one special per trimester instead of all four specials that we have or six specials at Wentworth. We have four at K-2. Um, and so we're still working on that, but trying to reduce the community spread, trying to reduce the um, number of people the specialist teachers come in contact with um, and trying to simplify the schedule as much as possible. So that's one thing we're looking at, but nothing's been decided yet. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is, um, you guys, so I keep hearing three to six feet. Like, I thought it was six, I guess, where does that discrepancy come in and, and like, is it three feet or is it six feet? So if you look at the guidance that was released from the state a week ago, Friday, if you go on the state DOE website, um, it is very explicitly stated that students must be three to six feet apart. Or not so explicitly stated. <laughs> I think well, my understanding of three was their preference is six feet and that is still the standard okay. that we should go by. I guess that's my, that was kind of my question. Um, and then lastly, um, Chris, you had talked about screenings or maybe Diane had said it at the beginning. Um, is that a screening that will happen at school? Like will the temperatures t be taken as, as children come into the, the building and adults or what does that look like? Yeah. So we talked about that quite a bit in our committee and, um, that screening, at the plan for now would be for that screening to be done at home, um, both staff and families doing that with their students. And part of what we talked about is uh, just the immense difficulty of screening that many students coming in every day. 
um, and uh, uh, being able to monitor and keep track of that. So we really felt like it was um, more practical, I think, to do outreach and education with families about the importance of the self-screening tools um, to potentially provide some support to families who may need access to things like thermometers, uh, but to have families and staff do that at home before um, coming into school. So for example, Hillary, another example would be um, uh, if we were gonna do the self checks ourselves as a school, we would almost have to think about doing those before a student got on the bus, right? So now we're talking about our bus driver is gonna be taking kids temperature before they get on the bus. There's just a whole host of issues with, with us trying to do that, um, that in the end our committee felt like it was better to have families do that. And Chris, that was really with the weigh-in of, uh, you had a lot of medical professionals on your committee, correct? We did. We were fortunate to have, um, I think, at one, one meeting, we, I think we had five different doctors in there with us. Um, and that was uh, an area that we had consensus on. There really wasn't much, you know, no disagreement about that piece. They were comfortable with that approach. Quick question. Um, what happens if a student is unable to keep a mask on? What options do we have? Um, well, we have a lot of options, but you know, we that's the whole point of providing the physical distancing as well as the face coverings. And um, one thing that we learned in our committee from our health experts was that depending on the age group, that the younger kids are far less efficient at transmitting the virus because they just don't have the same power to cough or spread aerosol droplets as far as an adult or a larger child does. Um, so it just depends. The younger kids, they, we are going to take mass breaks. We are going to be, you know, getting outside as much as possible and those kinds of things. But we'll just have to deal with that as it comes. I mean, I was talking to a preschool teacher just today who said that she's doing three to five-year-olds and they're keeping their masks on as much as possible. And you just have to sometimes build tolerance to that. The other piece is, um, you know, obviously if there are medical reasons why any person might not be able to wear a mask, whether that be a student or an adult, um, there is the leeway for those folks to wear face shields. Um, the department has given um, at that as an accommodation. Great. Thank you, Diane. Kristen? I had a quick question about um, one of the recommendations was about N95 masks and PPE for the nurses. And I'm wondering in your self protection for teachers to be in close contact with students. In, in some, they, some cases, they just have to be. And will they also get the... Sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite catch all of the... I'm not sure if it's my connection or, or Kristen's. It's probably mine. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if you, where you guys discuss the N95 masks and the PPE for the nurses, if you also discussed providing those for teachers who work in close contact with students. Oh, sure, great question. So um, uh, the recommendation for um, uh, staff who are not nurses um, was more around providing um, both the surgical masks, which are kind of those, you know, those paper masks that you've probably seen around the blue paper in combination with a face shield as opposed to using an N95 mask. And the two factors that we discussed around that were first that um, you actually need to have a fitting done for an N95 mask. And it's a, it, this was news to me, something I learned in our committee is a pretty involved, fairly involved process to have that done properly. And then the second piece, um, obviously, is just the availability of those masks, I think, is still uh, potentially challenging. So the recommendation, for example, for some of our special education staff that might be working closely with students who need um, personal care, uh, help with toileting, would be to use, you know, gloves, um, the mask, and then the face shield uh, to protect the eyes as well, and, and potentially a gown. So. Sarah? 
Thanks, Dan. Um, so you guys talked a lot about the options for remote learning for students. I'm curious if, if the same consideration has been made for teachers who are maybe high risk or are uncomfortable going back full time if, if they have also given the um, option to be remote. So I'm happy to answer that. So um, we have surveyed all of our staff um, because again, absolutely, we want to make accommodations um, for those folks who are in a high risk group themselves, um, who have a family member that is in a high risk group, um, or um, there's also a, a piece around um, um, around uh, family care um, in terms of the care for children. And so um, our HR department put that survey out to all of our staff. Um, they're looping back to individuals now and um, those determinations will be made on a case by case basis um, with employees in regards to uh, what, what type of leave they might um, qualify for or if they are able to work remotely, how we might match them up um, with students who are working remotely. Um, and so our HR department is working uh, very steadily with employees on this piece. Okay, thanks, Dan. Okay. Alicia? Thanks. Um, my question's similar um, to, to yours about the mask wearing, but a little bit different. I'm wondering if we're going to, um, if you're going to um, modify the student handbooks where um, for disciplinary purposes and for expectations regarding social distancing and mask wearing, because from, from my perspective, there's um, a component of some students may be unable to follow the rules and some students may be unwilling to follow the rules. And um, when it's a, a matter of unwilling, that, that to me is akin to, um, you know, potentially harmful behavior to other students. And so at that point, I do think that we need to consider it a potential disciplinary um, action and and at that point I think we would probably need to modify the handbook and I'm wondering if that's been discussed I don't think it has been discussed I think that's a great question um, and I would I think the administrators would treat that like any other situation if somebody is not uh, following directives from any staff member first would talk to them and, and try to get them to understand what the directive is. And if they continue to not follow the directive, then I think that's when, you know, one of the administrators can intervene with the staff member and the student and process what's going on. So I think, again, I, I hope that that would not be an issue. And, uh, but I think we would, we would treat it like any other way. And to be honest with you in the handbook, there's probably something that may cover that already, not following, following a directive from uh, the classroom teacher administration. Now, there are students, more complex special ed students that you would have to modify that and you would probably not discipline the student necessarily because they might have some reason why they're doing that, um, tactile defensive, whatever, whatever it is. And so again, in those situations, it would be a common sense approach to try to find an alternative way to educate the student to comply. Just worry about um, taking sort of the special ed component out. I worry about not having the expectations set for even the teachers to know, you know, what what am I expected to do in, in this situation? And, and uh, you know, I'm sure that people are gonna wanna feel comfortable that this is 
some, you know, we had the hands-off policy, whatever, and, and, and um, that this is the way it's going to be handled if my child's subjected to that type of offensive contact. Again, the, the purpose of, of the calendar change that you'll be talking about later tonight, those three days is, would be staff days to really prepare for the opening of school. And, and those conversations could happen at the school level. I'm sure the building principals could talk to staff about that. Um, and we'll go from there. Okay. Anne? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. I, I just want to say too that this is an area where the high school students who were on our committee were had some great ideas and they really thought that some student produced videos and messages sort of public service announcement type things could go a long way in helping students all understand that we're all here to protect each other and these are the things we're doing and especially with sports teams and clubs and things if you want to keep these things going and you don't want to get the whole team sequestered, quarantined, you know, then we all need to wear our masks and, and do our part. And so they had some great ideas on how to help encourage that. And I know that doesn't answer your question exactly, but, um, you know, I know that other school districts are looking at students signing pledges to agree to follow the rules while they're in school, sort of like pledges to how to behave on the bus and pledges, class pledges on how to behave in class. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways we can address it, and we haven't quite gotten to the level of detail yet about what we're going to do if kids don't, but it, it is a really valid question and a good one, but um, we have thought a lot about how to help encourage it and the positive side of it already, and hopefully that those things will be happening and being um, produced and and put out to students before school starts or right at the beginning of school so that we have as much buy-in as possible. Those are great ideas. I love the students always come up with the best ideas. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I do want to kind of go back to um, a public comment that came in again late. This came from Jenny Jubliss, um, a local pediatric infectious disease physician who also has a daughter at Wentworth. And she's been working at the state level on the committee for recommendations. I'm worried listening to the green level, it sounds as if the school system is thinking that green will be no social distancing or masking. And that is not the case. It is important to understand that three to six feet and masks are in place through all levels. And if we cannot do that, that we will not be in green. And again, I you know, I apologize if that was how the uh, explanation was taken. That wasn't my intention. Um, I think when I went back, because I saw her comment come in, um, I went back and looked at how green is written. It said that we would be following um, those CDC and state guidelines. And so again, the only shift we would be making um, would be if uh, the state shifted that guidance for us. So okay. I apologize. No. Um it really so was just, more to make sure everyone at home had heard this and understood it as well. Agreed. So does, is there a, can we ever be green then? Because there's, we don't have enough physical space for all our students and teachers to be three to six feet apart. Am, is that correct? I'm not sure. You know, again, I think it's going to depend on um, how guidance may change. So, right. right. So I guess we can't be green if the guidance stays the way it is now. We, the guidance would have to change for us to be able to be in. in well, green. I think we could, the state could say that we're green, but we might not be able to go green if we can't fit the requirements. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's so, what I mean. So if that's I, what I, that's. If yeah, our metric was that low, but we couldn't physically meet those requirements, we might right. need to stay in yellow. Yes. That's exactly what I meant. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sarah? Thanks. Um, just, I guess just go back to my previous question that I had around what happens if a student in a class gets sick. I don't know that that was covered in the health section um, unless I missed it. But maybe you guys can cover us. Chris or somebody can cover that off again. Yeah, um, 
We didn't include that bullet specifically because that um, what we'd be doing in that instance is uh, Sarah is following the CDC recommendations. So uh, the guidance around that will come directly from the state. And um, if we have a, a, a positive test, they'll they'll do you know there'll be contact tracing um, for that particular student. And then the guidelines around self isolation that would all be following the CDC recommendations um, around that around that piece. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking, and and maybe the answer is we have to wait to see what the CDC says, but. Um, you know, if the idea is to keep kids in pods, then I think the, the concept is if, if one gets sick, then you only have to sort of eliminate, remove that pod and not the whole school. Is that accurate? Correct. So, um, I'm seeing a lot of nods. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm not a doctor. I just associated with doctors on the committee. But, um, one thing that I heard was, um, when they're looking for, uh, to try to identify with the contact tracing, right? Like which students or which staff may need to be out of school and self-isolate. Um, they're looking at metrics like being within a six foot radius of the student who tested positive for, I think it's a period of at least 15 minutes. So um, that is kind of the guideline they would look to. So <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that even a whole pod or a whole class would necessarily be out. It would just be those students that the CDC identified using those guidelines. Um, and then the other piece of that is there's also guidelines from the CDC around what we would need to do to clean the facility. So, you know, either a classroom or a bus, um, those types of things. But that's not something that we have local control over. We would be following the, the state recommendations for that. Thanks. Alicia? I'm just seeing comments coming in about people concerned about the lack of ability to prepare um, for daycare and, and work schedules. And I know, I hate to say it because I know how hard people have been working to get this information out and to come up with a plan. I'm just wondering if there is a way to um, try to get them that information um, quicker if there's any ability to do that. I mean, it's it's like we, we want to pull them and get and um, get their input, which will take time. Um, and so that's a that's a great thing and something I value. But on the other hand, I'm I'm hearing the stress associated with the delay. I'm just wondering um, if there's a way to speed it up at all. I would say that, you know, we share that same concern. It, it's hard work and uh, Diane and I speak to the superintendents once a week and all the superintendents are feeling the, the stress and, and the struggles of trying to get a plan and get everything organized and get our schools prepared, get staff prepared. And we wish we could have it all perfectly done and, and I, I don't think anybody expects that. Um, we. But I want people to know we understand your frustration. We hear you. We're working really long hours to try to get this together. Um, and and I just appreciate the candidness and openness about your frustration. And we are listening and we will do our best. And we will do what's right for the students as well. All right, I think that's it on the health section of probably ready to move into the next group. Yes, that would be the academic subgroup. I had the pleasure of working with Kathy Terrell and Holly Grafham as co-facilitators. Holly was working with us in an intern capacity. Uh, and we work some, with some amazing um, folks from our community, parents, students, teachers. Uh, <clears throat> And it was quite a large group. There were 28 members of our committee. Uh, we began by taking a look at those main DOE guidelines. And they worked in small groups, breakout groups, to merge those DOE guidelines with the yellow, green, and uh, red scenarios. We then broke into phase level groupings so that recommendations could be made with the students' needs, developmental needs in mind um, from that point moving forward. 
We also took a look at the June panorama survey data, the community, the staff, and the student data. We also took a look at the July data as well. To make these recommendations, I'm gonna go over them. They are in far more detail within the plan. Uh, all of this information is, or all of our work, our agendas and notes are all posted on the START team website, including all of the data. And we're adding more of the documents um, as, the, as um, the background documents as time allows. So very quickly as an overview, this is a DOE requirement. We are going to be required to take daily attendance. We had great flexibility last spring, um, but the expectations is that students will be engaged in instruction in school, whether that be remote, remote or on site, um, daily. So for those schools who take period attendance, we will be taking a period attendance. Uh, we want to hold high expectations that was very clear in the recommendations, but also to offer what we call scaffolded opportunities. We wanna provide students with supports to ensure that they can reach and exceed our grade level goals. That came through in both data and, our, and, our, and the main guidelines. We also wanna be equitable with those students who are in school and those students who will be accessing their learning remotely. Uh, that means we're talking about, all right, if our students need manipulatives in order to do their math, we want to send home some manipulative kits. Uh, so we're talking a lot about what are the supplies and materials that students at home will need from school. We also want to make sure that we're balancing, again, that online and offline learning activities. It's about effective teaching and learning. And so our teachers are fantastic. They um, applied their creative talents and their perseverance to do best for students. And we're gonna continue, we're gonna build off that and continue um, supporting them as they move forward um, in the fall. We also do wanna provide family and student training opportunities, both synchronously and asynchronously. So for example, um, what was discussed earlier by Dawn is yes, we want to work with students in the first few days of school, not only in healthy habits, but also in how to use their technology and how to do that in a healthy way. So there'll be a range of opportunities for students, but also we wanna help support our parents as well. So there will be uh, periodic um, workshops. We refer to them sometimes as parent universities. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy, who's going to talk a little bit about um, our recommendations. We were looking for that consistency, clarity, simplicity, and also equity. You'll see those themes throughout. Um, and we really worked hard at developing recommendations that could apply across all models because we will have students both on site and remote. Kathy? So we've, we've talked about types of instruction and that we want both synchronous and asynchronous methods. Our um, data from community, students, and staff all showed that um, people want an increase in the synchronous time with teachers. Even students said, I wish we had more Google Meets. I wish I had more time to have that live interaction with um, my teachers. And also a balance between the online and the offline learning activities. and. In this equity standpoint, um, families that choose the remote learning environment, the students will have the same opportunities and the same learning that occurs in the um, in-person um, learning. And to the extent possible, create integrative project-based learning activities through articulated themes, topics, and standards that is a main DOE recommendation. That's also going, teachers will need time to plan um, those inter, the integrated um, opportunities. In grading, assessment, and reporting, we heard clearly that um, families want the grades. They want the grading to be like it was before um, COVID. So we're planning to go back to the grading we used before. Um, consider modifications to practices to provide equity across all three learning models. 
that might be considering more project-based assessments, giving student choice on assessments. So we could go to the next slide. Organizing students. So the daily schedule to include social, emotional, and as well as academic learning. Talked about starting with morning meetings, whether you're in person or remote learning in the morning. Um, consistent schedule across all three learning models. If we do need to move from in person to remote, students would have that same schedule. The students that um, are a student will go to school in person and have a schedule on the day, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday. Then on Thursday, Friday, they'd have the same schedule while at home um, for remote learning. And then organizing students into cohorts that remain together for the majority of the day so that the um, we may need to go back to the schedule that we already have and the placement of students and have them make sure that they're staying together for the day when we can. I think, you know, at the high school level, their students do have a lot of different courses where they're, you know, they can't stay together as well as we can in K-8. Um, organizing of staff, that the students stay in place as much as possible while the teachers move to room to room um, as much as possible. And then with the staff, you know, they're in, a, they're in cohorts of teams so that for their planning, instruction, and assessment, they're working in smaller groups. With response to intervention and student support systems that we're making sure that there are supports for all students, students in person and students in remote learning and that school teams will review student progress data and then address possible needs of students, whether they're in remote or in school, continuing our intervention meetings to meet the needs of all students. Thank you. Uh, just to summarize the work, um, these were the themes, but what came up across all the phase levels uh, was the need for professional development and planning time. And as you noted in those Wednesday afternoons, those were um, built to provide some of that time. Uh, but as we consider, as you consider the school calendar, um, this list is just a starting list. Um, we scoured um, the um, recommendations and kind of clumped these. Um, but um, just to orient staff to what the new procedures, how to operate in buildings um, will take some time. Uh, we are looking at consistent technology tools and platforms. We'll be using Seesaw K5 and Google Classroom 612, and we're working on some shifts within those applications. Don will talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But it's really about the effective instructional practices. Um, it really is, we're not talking about, um, and you'll see some images, which when I first um, saw those images, I thought, whoa, that's not quality teaching and learning, but we will be moving from those. But you know, you see these diagrams with seats in rows and students, you, get, you might get the image that we're gonna have our students sitting there all day masked and just listening to information mm -hmm. that's being delivered. That's not what we're talking about at all. There were some very creative, engaging activities when we were um, experiencing our distance learning this past spring. And we wanna continue with those effective teaching and learning practices and seeking feedback along the way from our parents and in particular, our students. So there's also a need for curriculum and instruction unit lesson planning. Um, Kathy mentioned project-based, our integrated theme-based. Um, the state is working on developing some units and some lessons as well. Uh, you've also probably heard about outdoor education and we're exploring all of those options. What we need to do is we need to bring teachers together before school starts to identify what, is the, what are the essential learning goals for our students. It's not going to look like 177 student days moving forward in terms of instruction. And so we need to figure out what our curriculum goals are this year and provide those themes and those integration points. 
We also have a need to talk about assessment. Uh, how do we make it fair between remote and in class? Um, grading and reporting practices, we wanna make sure that those students who are um, learning in a remote environment have some choices. We also wanna make sure that you know, if students fall ill, we wanna extend um, the time and the recovery time, particularly if there's learning loss there and provide those supports. So um, it would be great to have the entire month of September off to plan. Um, we know that is not practical. We know that we also want to, we're torn because we want to have those students as soon as we can, but we also want to do a quality job of teaching and learning with those students. So the recommendation on the part of the START committee would be to start delay the student start um, for one week, um, which is really just September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And I believe Diane will talk a little bit about that when we get to the calendar, or Sandy will talk a little bit about that when we get to the calendar portion. I'm going to turn it over to Don. So uh, in conjunction with the um, academic um, discussions uh, with the START team and with uh, the leadership teams within the district, uh, we've uh, put a lot of work into uh, what kind of technology supports need to be in place for teachers and students, um, and by extension, the families uh, who are supporting our students. Um, we want to be able to equip our teachers with uh, more flexibility with video and audio technology so that they're not having to park right in front of their laptop like this and not being able to um, utilize uh, projector and whiteboard and other resources in the classroom um, without having to carry their laptop around. Um, we want to make sure that we front load uh, professional development for all of our professional staff. Monique just mentioned that that's something that we want to try to utilize some extra time for before we actually even start school. Uh, we would like to look at um, making sure that we've provided school issued devices and an orientation for all students K-12. My staff has been investing um, basically every working minute this summer making sure that's ready to go. And at this point we have devices uh, ready to go in all grade levels at all schools. We're putting the finishing touches on uh, the high school and at Wentworth, but uh, right now what we have is, uh, for example, in K2, we've actually already gotten to the point where we're labeling the devices by student name um, and we're putting little login cards uh, right there with the laptop so the students can log right into the portal for all of their learning applications. So, I mean, we're really trying to put some effort into that. We want to make sure that we're in a good position, like the question that was asked earlier, to support connectivity for those who need internet access or need it to be boosted. We're very sensitive to the fact that not only do we have families um, who are uh, who have needs um, in a more traditional sense, but that we also have a lot of uh, upheaval going on within families across the community. Um, and that jobs have changed. Um, and so, and people are making some important decisions, uh, difficult decisions. And so, uh, finances are, are a, a rough spot right now. So we want to be in a good position to be able to support our families however we can. We've been putting a lot of effort into optimizing how our staff can use Google Classroom in grades six through 12, as well as Seesaw, which we had done a fairly large pilot with in K2 and now, and several classrooms at Wentworth. So we're expanding that to K5. We wanna make sure that that is as friendly and easy to use for students and families. And um, our expansion on that is going really well at this point. Um, we're going to need some time working with our teachers uh, and staff to make sure that we have good materials that can uh, communicate what are those core education software platforms, what are the applications, what are the tools um, that are available for teaching and learning, and then what is that uh, kind of tech coaching, tech training model that we can put in place 
whether it's on site, online, or both, uh, so that students, parents, and um, staff have ongoing training and coaching going on. It's not just about the technology itself, the little widget that we're putting, handing someone, but how can we build those skills to kind of scaffold people up where they feel comfortable using it as part of the bigger picture teaching and learning? Okay. Of course I have questions. I would um, have never thought that. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> we're going to go with the harder ones first. When we're looking at the calendars and um, students being, you know, two days in, two days out, we have a lot of Monday holidays. Is there a thought of making sure that we're having equity between the students who are Monday, Tuesday home versus the Thursday, Friday at home students? That's certainly something that we can look at, yeah. Okay, um, and with that would go snow days. Are we now expecting that there will not be snow days because students are going to be remote two days a week? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question, Leanne. Um, <laughs> I have to think about that, but if, if we have students in school, some students in school, and the roads are bad, we're going to have to cancel school. Now, if everybody's remote, I suppose we could talk more about having that be classified as a school day, but I think the board would have to vote on that um, or at least discuss that. Okay. That's my initial thoughts. Um, I just thought I'd put it out there. Yeah. Um, and this one might be a little bit more of a, of a softball, but it's going to sue. And specifically, senior privileges. Um, right now, in order for a senior to have senior privileges, they need to take six credits. Have we thought about maybe relaxing those rules a little bit in order to maybe lighten the load in some classes so that more people can be on campus? We, um, when we change the school board policy, that allowed seniors to have five classes if um, they were targeted and all set to graduate on time. We changed the senior privilege policy. So um, seniors would be able to have senior privileges as long as they passed to start the year it would be if they passed all their classes for fourth quarter or semester two. Um, and for the full privileges, they'd have to have an average of 85 or better for um, the late start, early release, it is an average of 75. Since we had the passing um, or insufficient evidence this past spring, I think everyone would start off, to be fair, getting the full privileges. Um, if students didn't meet that requirement, we always have a mid-quarter check-in where if they've pulled their grades up and had a better start to the year, they could then qualify partway through the quarter to get them for the rest of the quarter. And we recheck that at every quarter's end to set them up for the next quarter. Excellent, thank you. Kristen? Yeah, I think this question is more specific to K-5, but do we know yet that for the families that choose to be entirely remote, who's going to be teaching them yet? And will they have any sort of like classroom structure? Will they be grouped? Like if we, I guess if we're asking parents to choose that option basically next week, I'm wondering if we know a little bit more about what that's going to look like. So my understanding was that while the survey opens next week, it's going to remain open for some time while some of the finer points are worked out and Diane will talk at the end or Sandy will talk at the end about what some of the next steps are. So the choice doesn't necessarily have to be made next week if there's some piece of information that you're waiting on. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Hillary? Oh, oh sorry, I'm... Leanne. Sorry, Can I just Kelly. try to ask an earlier question too about the Monday inequity 
Um, I forget mm -hmm. which person asked that question. So we looked at the calendar and it's, I think it's only within one day. There are four Monday holidays, um, but then there's the Thursday, Friday of Thanksgiving and then the Friday prior to um, April break. So it's very, very close, um, very, you know, and if it turns out based on snow days or things like that, I remember, I think it was last year that almost every snow day fell on a Wednesday mm -hmm. and we just, on a red day, and we just were able to adjust kind of on the fly. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hillary. Thanks. Um, I just want to clarify, um, I know we're going to be talking about the calendar later, but um, did, has the DOE again waived the minimum day requirements for um, for districts? So they have not yet made that waiver, although um, in several recent meetings that I have been part of, there has been discussion um, that the commissioner uh, or the governor will be waiving that, but uh, not as of yet. So in order to make a decision about the uh, um, extending, sorry, um, delaying the first week of school, if, if there's no official word on waiving those days, would we then have to um, extend the end of the school year? No, we can go into the specifics of that when we okay. move the proposal forward. Okay. April? So Kristen keeps scooping me, um, but I'm gonna piggyback on her question and say that just in thinking about the families trying to make a decision between doing a hybrid model and doing the full remote, um, I'm wondering if there's gonna be some kind of publication or something that we're gonna put out for the families so that they can see what that plan is gonna look like side by side so that they can make a more informed choice. And then the second part of my question is, would it be possible to do some kind of um, info night or um, Q&A for the community after tonight, now that some of the details are being um, discussed so that when people are filling out their surveys and they're trying to really make these decisions, um, that they get their questions answered um, you know, in a timely way so that we can keep the ball moving forward, I guess. So I'll jump on that. So um, we actually have um, talked about having um, a couple of things that are really closely related to what you're talking about. Um, one is making sure that we are um, really sharing as much detail with folks as we can, um, putting together an FAQ on our website so that uh, these questions, I I'm writing them all down as you're asking them tonight. And I know others are, are coming in to um, us via email as well. And so we wanna make sure that instead of answering a question a hundred times to a hundred folks that we're putting that information um, as transparently as possible. And then the other thing that um, we've talked about um, with building leadership, and again, like you're stealing our slides for later, but that's great thinking, um, is uh, doing um, some parent forums as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Diane. Um, I have another question. I don't know if this is the time to ask it or if it should wait, but if students are going into a all remote learning so the parents have opted that they're home all the time can they still participate in clubs and sports yes in the same way that a homeschool student um, in a traditional year can participate in activities and and athletics um, a, a student in a remote setting could as well excellent thank you um, Hillary your hand is up did you have another question okay all right, um, I know that we have other sections to go through, but I'd like to propose a uh, five minute break. Um, this, I think everyone probably could use just a quick step away um, before we uh, hop back in. 
So if we could come back at 8.05 and continue. Great. Thanks, everyone.
All right, we've got a quorum of everybody back from the board. Um, so if we've got the folks who are presenting the next section, I say we uh, go ahead and get started. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so I would um, like to start by publicly thanking uh, the members of our social and emotional learning committee um, for giving up very precious summer hours um, for the work that we did together. Um, we'd like to give a special shout out to Jay and Julia, who were our student members, because not only did they represent the Scarborough student body quite well, um, but SEL is really about understanding and amplifying student voice. Um, so it was perfect to have them as partners um, in this work. So thank you, Jay and Julia. And I wish I could personally thank your parents. They're doing a great job. Um, so to provide a little background information about social and emotional learning, um, this is not new work in our district. Um, the SPS mission statement includes the phrase, we will ensure every student is empowered to become a resilient lifelong learner. And SEL is foundational to meeting that outcome. We actually have phase level SEL teams um, and representatives from each of those teams comprise a larger district-wide K-12 SEL committee. Um, all of these groups meet regularly um, and have been doing so over the past year and a half to create and implement action plans that best address the SEL needs of our students. Um, in that work, we have been using the CASEL framework, and CASEL is an acronym for uh, Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Um, they produce a lot of research um, and support documents um, for social emotional learning for school districts. Um, and we have included a graphic of that framework on our slide um, for reference. So the SEL plan um, that we are presenting today from our START committee um, is aligned to this CASEL framework and our recommendations um, we believe will help focus our ongoing K-12 work um, so that we can seam seamlessly continue um, as we enter into the fall. Um, finally, um, we, we may be sharing our work today on just one slide for this presentation, um, but SEL work is very wide and very deep. So we um, strongly encourage those who are interested in this part um, to look through our action plan um, and see all that it has um, in detail. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly Crosby, who's going to share the committee recommendations. Thanks, Jess. So can you hear me okay? As Jessica mentioned, um, I'm going to review some of the key recommendations that go across all three models of learning. So whether we're remote, hybrid, or in fully in-person, these recommendations stand for our return to school um, in whatever capacity. And importantly, it's, it's critical to note that this work is truly for each and every. So we're talking about students, supporting families, and supporting our staff. Um, first and foremost, and I'm, this is an ongoing theme throughout the evening, is a critical need for professional development for all staff in a variety of topics. Um, I'll just mention a few that the committee felt were extremely critical. Um, building relationships and integrating SEL into in-person and distance learning environments um, is the first area of need for professional development. We also need PD in creating equitable learning environments focused on and ensuring anti-bias, anti-racism, cultural proficiency and inclusive practices. Third in our um, need for PD is identifying um, for staff to be able to identify signs of trauma and trauma informed practices and other mental health concerns. So um, for example, anxiety, depression in their students. And then finally, um, sadly, so PD around supporting um, grieving students. Um, the second recommendation, key recommendation that we have is to develop a plan for re-entry screening. So we're not talking about health screening per se here, we're talking about SEL screening, and that could come in um, many forms, some of which one-to-one um, -one interviews, conferencing, and then also ongoing progress monitoring for those SEL needs of our students. And then um, the next key recommendation is identifying or developing 
programming that addresses SEL needs for all. And as Jessica mentioned, that work has begun. Um, the K-5 SEL committee has been um, meeting regularly for two years and the K-12 committee for one year. Um, so we have a good foothold, but there's certainly, um, you know, needs have shifted and amplified. And so um, this is a great springboard for the work. Um, along with identifying and developing programming is um, the need to create and publicize a differentiated list of SEL resources that staff can access um, for their own wellness and for that of their students and developing um, strategies, materials, and resources with particular attention, and this has been mentioned a few times tonight, for those students who are transitioning, not only between grades, but um, particularly between phases, you know, they have had this sense of, you know, a really quick closure of their previous school, and then now they're transitioning to a new and unfamiliar um, school in some ways, and I know some work has already been done via virtual step-up days and videos and those pieces, but the committee is recommending really um, giving attention to those. And then um, the final recommendation is um, prioritizing time for SEL. And we were really pleased to see that we were on the same page as the academic um, subcommittee group because um, they mentioned the same thing in their recommendation. So specifically designate this transition period as a focus on social and emotional needs and then designate that time in an ongoing capacity. I'm gonna pass it to um, Nate Terrio, um, assistant principal at the high school, and he's gonna talk about other important considerations for SEL. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we had uh, several through lines that ran through many of our conversations, um, and those are reflected in our important considerations. Um, firstly, uh, we wanna proactively destigmatize conversations and needs around mental health. Um, I think it's clear to everybody that this pandemic has deeply affected people socially and emotionally. Um, and we wanna make sure that people feel that um, it's okay for them to bring forth some of the issues that they might be dealing with. Um, secondly, we wanna uh, prioritize SEL strategies for students and staff. Um, again, uh, that's another through line. Um, we know that you know, supporting students is crucially important. And we also know that um, our staff need to be in a position to do that. And so we wanna make sure that we support um, both groups um, in terms of their SEL needs. Um, lastly, um, we also um, noticed in feedback and conversations and discussions, um, it's really critical for us um, to try to think carefully um, about how we, or what's, how many systems we're using. Um, and the group felt pretty strongly that we need to limit um, and centralize some of our communication systems during the pandemic um, so as not to increase stress levels or anxiety among families. We wanna make sure that we're communicating well as a team um, to our uh, stakeholder groups. Um, so as Jess and Kelly um, already alluded to, um, this is ongoing work. Um, K-5 has been at this for two years now. Um, and a K-12 committee was formed last year. Um, there's also been some discussion of expanding that committee um, to include other stakeholder groups. Um, so if, if people are interested in helping to support that work, um, because this group will be engaged in that work throughout the year, uh, but if there are stakeholders out there who are interested in, in joining, this work, uh, joining this group and its administrators, um, staff, uh, and some students right now, um, but if parents are out there and are interested in supporting the work, um, please reach out and let us know um, and we'll get back to you. That's all I got. Questions about that? Yes. Um, based under this, I know we've talked in the plan, it says, you know, parents can um, relook at whether their child is 100% remote or working through a hybrid at the end of a quarter. If they find that for whatever reason, for emotional or a social reason, can we make accommodations if it's just not working out for the student to be in one place or the other uh, mid term? I'm not sure that that's specifically an SEL question and more of a overall structural question, but I mean, I would just go back to our mission, which is ensuring a welcoming and inclusive learning environment for each and every. And so I know that there are logistical pieces to making changes midstream, but um, I think 
that we've demonstrated time and again that we'll do whatever it takes to make school work for um, for our kiddos. And so, I mean, I guess that's kind of a long way of saying we're going to make it work for students. Thank you. And, and I know we've always done everything possible. This is really just to try to help those folks at home who may be concerned about a decision that they're making and sure. what decision am I going to make and what can I do if it isn't working for me? And in the, in, in the more detailed plan, um, we really emphasize, emphasize the need for um, creating and communicating community partnerships um, because students, when they're not physically in the building, lose access to um, supports that they have you know, when they're in the building. So if somebody is choosing full remote and um, may take advantage of resources and supports in a different way too, so. And one of the things if I can add on a little bit is uh, in our plan is that we, we really want to emphasize that multi-tiered system of supports for students. So um, at every phase level, we have a process um, to, to for student support teams, um, RTI or response to intervention. So um, to, to uh, maybe quickly answer that question, Leanne, it would be that we would go to that team and we would meet with families and we would do everything that we would normally do to make sure that that student got exactly what, um, what they could. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Good evening. I'm going to start with the operations group and uh, would just like to start by thanking Graham Stoner, Mike Legage, Peter Esposito, Todd Jebson, uh, Sarah Redman, who work a lot behind the scenes and uh, in our groups, as well as the parents, students, staff, and public safety who were involved in all of our meetings. So thank you for everyone that was involved. The uh, large group that we had uh, divided into four breakout groups. And those four great breakout groups will each be reporting tonight. We have uh, transportation, which you can see in the slide, facilities, nutrition, and athletics and co-curricular activities. So we had quite a task uh, to get through so many different questions, so many different uh, plans. And what we've uh, worked on is starting with the uh, survey that went out to parents and guardians at the beginning of July. Uh, a big question that, that first came up is, how would we provide transportation for our students? And in the survey, a question was asked, how many parents, parents and guardians would be able to transport their students to school? We found that 78% of the respondents said that they'd be able to transport. And that would be a huge burden taken away from our transportation. As you could see with the numbers, and we'll, we'll go through the seating chart that's in front of you, that uh, there will be another upcoming survey so that we would ask for a commitment for our planning for transportation. So with the yellow and the green, we had uh, again asked for uh, parents, guardians to be able to transport children on a regular schedule. And it's a recommendation that students are transported in smaller groups so that social distancing can be done on the buses. With the social distancing, you could see a diagram that is uh, on the slide. The driver is on the left front and the S's are the students that are socially distanced throughout the bus. Recommendations include face coverings at the bus stops as well as face coverings on the bus hand sanitizer upon entering and exiting the bus, seated assignments, and clear disinfection protocols every time our buses are used. For our next slide, we are going to be discussing classroom safety and Brem Stoner will discuss classroom safety. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm gonna go over some of the recommendations to make sure that we are um, really minimizing the risk of exposure to students and staff. And they are as follows. Um, 
Teachers are going to modify seating at tables so that students will have adequate space. Tables and desks will be wiped down routinely throughout the day or if new groups of students enter a room. Um, we are asking students to use proper hand hygiene and wash their hands. Uh, soap and water really preferred, but also we'll have hand sanitizer uh, upon entering and before leaving the classroom. As weather permits, windows may be open and we'll get to ventilation in a little bit. And uh, teachers are encouraged to bring students outside for portions of their instruction, uh, certainly when it's appropriate to do so. And I wanted to also go through and share just some examples of classroom setups. I believe on the left is a high school classroom, uh, Wentworth classroom on the right. So I know there was some conversation around the distancing. Uh, current recommendations from the state and CDC are around three to six feet. And obviously that's gonna have an impact on how many students are able to be in a space. So if you look there at the six foot up in the upper left corner in a 750 square foot classroom, you're gonna be able to fit 13 desks. So uh, if you obviously go to a three foot distance or some variation of that, um, you can certainly fit more desks. Uh, obviously, um, the size of the student um, and phase level is an important consideration here. On the right side with Wentworth, uh, we found in setting up a classroom um, using the six, six foot guideline, we could have nine desks and uh, with a three foot between, we could do 15. And even though you can't really see it there, we're also taking into account um, adequate space of at least six to eight feet from the front board out to where the students would be to allow teachers um, some sort of safe space uh, to do their work in the front of the classroom. And I can speak to the Wentworth pictures there. There's six feet um, uh, between the, the rows there as well um, as you go back. So the classroom setups, again, here's another one. Um, again, with the six foot distancing, uh, that ranges from nine to 13 students. It does depend on the building. It also depends on other furniture that's in the classroom, um, such as laptop carts, tables, shelves for uh, curriculum materials. Uh, three foot distancing does obviously allow us to have more students in there. And again, depends on all of those factors. Um, and the next slide, I think, is going to take us to cafeteria, and I'll hand it back over to Mr. Courier. With our cafeteria procedures, a little bit was discussed earlier in the presentation about what would happen with food. Uh, some of the recommendations that came out of our subgroup of nutrition, some of the options would be distancing by eating in the classroom, possibly outdoors space six feet apart in the cafeteria due to eating and uh, most likely not have a face covering during that time. Uh, Prepackaging meals when possible and removing the self-service uh, items that were previously mentioned, uh, as well as food bars. Making meals available for delivery on the days where students are accessing their education remotely, a very important piece that our transportation and nutrition departments have worked together throughout the summer and throughout the uh, distance learning. Uh, making meals uh, for staff, uh, I'm sorry, ongoing staff training using PPE, uh, proper distancing in the workplace, as well as following safety sanitation protocols. There will be, uh, one of the discussions was modifying the daily advanced ordering system. So when students were, whether it's first period, when they check into school late, they'd be able to order their meals that would be sent to the cafeteria of that school. And the meals would be prepared when the orders are received. And then the food service payments could be made either online or a payment could be sent to the school. I always get the most riveting topics, so <laughs> I'll talk to you about ventilation. Um, our, uh, our HVAC systems actually are serviced in the summer and around the winter break. 
So through the December, January timeframe. So about every six months they're serviced and uh, they were just recently serviced uh, this summer and they go through uh, all of the air handlers and anything that actually uh, supplies air to occupied spaces. Uh, they're all cleaned, uh, checked for operational efficiency and so forth. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, talk about the need for um, increased airflow in classrooms. And they're referring specifically to the me mechanical increase of airflow where you have air feeding in. And uh, to the extent that we can do that, we will through our building automation systems, we can open the outside air dampers and, and help supply some more fresh air into the classrooms. In all the schools, before any fresh air is pulled in with the air handling systems, it's actually pushed through a filter. So the fresh air is filtered uh, before it hits the occupants. Um, all of our systems are currently operating and providing proper balance of fresh filtered air and they exhaust the stale air uh, or return air we call it to the outside. Um, the challenge with outside air temperatures in Maine is as you might imagine seasonally uh, this time of year we don't really want to pull in the 90 degree humid air uh, because it challenges any uh, temperature limits of, of individuals. Um, but whenever we can, we like to pull in as much outside and fresh air as we can. And we do this through a, an engineered design of our systems. So um, when the system senses high CO2, it brings in more fresh air. And when there is low CO2, it reduces that fresh air. Um, and we can override things. So um, I've heard quite a few people saying, can we open windows? And the answer is in an air conditioning uh, air conditioned building like Wentworth or the middle school, we would still recommend using that system because opening a window does not give you filtered air. It gives you dirty air from the outside with pollen and other allergens in it. Um, and our filters capture those before it's uh, sent into the rooms. But in unair conditioned buildings, um, we would uh, probably, and we do allow air uh, to come in through the windows um, as the outside air temperatures permit. Um, but again, you have to be sensitive to the, the occupants and their allergy sensitivities. So um, I would try to reduce the number of fans blowing around the room as the respiratory droplets, uh, which is the source of transmission of this disease, um, they really um, are not what we want blowing around the room. So we'd like to just kind of keep uh, natural airflow uh, rather than a forced airflow, if that makes sense. Uh, the next the next slide is uh, around a whole bunch of facilities needs. I'm apologizing for my camera. For some reason, it just died tonight, so that's why my screen is black. Um, and anyway, the facilities needs. So we are already uh, underway with retrofitting uh, the clinics at schools. We're required to have a sick and a well clinic um, at each school, or it's highly recommended, at least through the DOE, and so that is to make sure that kids who are exhibiting symptoms are not mixing with those who might just be coming in uh, to maybe take some medicine or, or have a, some other sort of well check um, at each clinic. Um, so I'm work, I've worked with the nurses and the uh, building leadership at each school to try and figure out a space where we can make that happen at each school. In some cases, it involves adding a sink or giving access to an additional bathroom or so forth. We're also working with our suppliers, and as you might imagine, plexiglass is in high demand uh, to create some protective um, screen barriers in the high transactional counter areas and the main offices and library main desks and things. And we've had a generous offer from a donor to help us um, fund that work and get it installed. So I'm working with that, that anonymous donor to make those things happen. And in addition, we're trying to get some uh, freestanding ones uh, for student desks at the K2 or student tables at the uh, K2 levels um, as well. Um, we've been working a lot with our custodial crew on enhancing the disinfecting and cleaning. We've purchased additional um, spraying machines. We call them electromagnetic sprayers where the uh, disinfectant is electromagnetically charged and sprayed to uh, disinfect surfaces. Uh, we have checklists for custodians to make sure they're doing that type of work. 
and we were talking about creating some training videos for the staff who will probably um, have a desire to assist with that as needs arise within their classrooms. Um, and uh, an additional thought that came up, and I'm working with our supply chain uh, representative as well to provide a cleaning kit in each classroom, which would include disinfectant uh, and safety equipment and cleaning cloths and so forth. Um, in addition, uh, <clears throat> we'd like that there be a written log for each room in each building that documents who's accessed the space for the contact tracing should that become necessary. Um, I also have ordered and we will probably also make a lot of signs and visual uh, pointers throughout the building to direct folks um, to maintain socially distant, wash their hands, um, and uh, for the custodians to remind them about the disinfecting protocols that we have. Um, I'll leave the next three bullets to, I think it's Brem, perhaps. Yep. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I want to just quickly go back to the, we won't go back on the slides, but if you remember the pictures we showed a few minutes ago, again, we'll have to definitely pay close attention to class sizes. As we know, we will have students who will be all remote. We will have students coming in um, a few days a week and students who come um, every day. And so based on the phase level and the uh, recommendations, we will be giving consideration uh, to making sure that the uh, available spaces we have are adequately spaced apart, um, given the three to six, six foot recommendations. Um, building leaders will also continue to conduct regular safety evacuation drills as we do. Um, and we'll look at all of the, um, again, building based uh, protocols that come with that. And then we'll also be communicating and planning with community services um, because we do obviously have space constraints. We also have space availability for before and after care. And a lot of that will be enrollment driven. But again, we are continuing to have that conversation and they were a part of our planning um, for these recommendations. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Mike Legage for us. Uh, activities in athletics. Thank you very much. Um, certainly, it probably sounds like a little bit of a broken record, but we'll certainly be following the Department of Education and CDC and lo uh, local guidelines as we look at returning to participation for athletics and activities. We also are governed by the Maine Principals Association. I'm certainly sure that people have seen the newspaper articles and seen on news about um, the kind of moving target of a start date for um, high school athletics, but um, we are we do have those governances and and working closely with those groups um, because we're getting prepared for an August third start. Originally, we have put quite a bit of work into um, our COVID nineteen plan. We actually created a website um, that's a link to our existing high school site and that really outlines all of our plans. It's a fluid document. We continue to upgrade it, update it as information comes in. Um, but you can see some of those targets that we, we talked about um, on the web page in terms of um, you know screenings, how we're going to handle screenings and how we're going to handle uh, face coverings and, and all our logistical and event operation um, strategies are all really outlined on that web page. We're also really um, uh, proud of, I guess, too, in terms of that web page is our FAQ section. Um, as uh, Dr. Nato mentioned, that they're going to uh, do that for this document and questions that come in about the academic side. We've been doing that already um, for athletics and activities as questions have come to us in um, we'll continue to update that as well so that we can, you know, provide that information out to everybody. Um, so we're, we're kind of ready to go. We're just, um, you know, waiting for that, um, you know, opportunity to start. We are continuing some discussions with, um, I'm having some discussions with Oak Hill Players Director 
and the One Act Play Director um, to begin to talk about those activities and what or if um, we're able to do, um, you know, those those productions, or are we going to, you know, look at some delay to those? So we are beginning to have those individual smaller groups discussions on the activity side um, to work through, um, you know, their their needs, um, you know, individually. And I think that's it. Hopefully you'll go to the web page and check it out. Nick? Uh, yes, I just had a question. Actually, it's all the way back to the first slide of this grouping, which is I think the bus slide. Um, and I know we've, we've talked about this in board meetings before. We've talked about the number of the ridership of our buses and what we're required by law to have and all of that. And I'm assuming all of that's been not waived because we're still going to have the same number of buses. But I guess my question is, is looking at the diagram, there was one S on every other seat. And that looked like a very small number of students on a bus that would normally hold probably three to four times as many students. Do we think we're going to be all set as far as bus volume to handle that? So I'll jump in a little bit because uh, we did get some information that there is uh, new information that is going to be released tomorrow in regards to buses. Again, this is just a great example of when I, um, you know, when you've heard me say tonight and other nights that we're constantly in draft form, this is our current thinking um, and we have to be willing to flex as new information comes out. So um, this particular diagram is based on the summer guidance. And so um, uh, to date, we are, uh, we would be available to transport 13 students per route. Um, I think Dave did a great job explaining that obviously if we were taking responsibility for transporting all the students we usually transport um, with this model and not more parents stepping up, we probably would not be able to open schools quite frankly um, because we have to be able to physically get kids to school. Um, so we were really um, excited that there was such a large volume of parents who said that they would be able to make the commitment um, to help us out by providing transportation. Um, and again, that was just a temperature that we did in July when we send our next survey out, we're gonna be looking for folks to make those commitments for us. Um, and again, um, how all that lays out is really going to help us determine if we can stay true to like that regular school day time, et cetera. That's perfect. It's a nice drawing, by the way. I have to say, you have no idea how long it took me to draw that picture. <laughs> I, other, I just had another quick question for Todd, actually. He thought ventilation wouldn't get a spotlight, but I actually wanted to ask, um, because I'm thinking of my long range planning work, I know the primary schools have oil, oil boilers, the middle school has uh, heat pumps, the Wentworth has geothermal, and my question is, is all of them use forced hot air, right? So we have, we have physical air exchange at all six locations, correct? Yes, okay. that's correct, yep. Great. That's it. Hillary? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, I have a few questions, but I, I wanted to expand a little bit on um, Nick's question. Um, I know that this was just preliminary, but if 75, say, percent of our parents are willing to transport students, is that a high enough percentage to be able to transport the rest on the buses with that scenario that you, the, the little picture that you, that you drew? We believe it is, um, you know, I've got to say, Sarah is um, literally working through all of that information compared to her current bus run list to see how those numbers would change. Um, and, and we'll do that again. But um, certainly if we look at like that number 13 is about 25%, um, you know, of the students 
that we would be transport that we would be able to transport. And so, you know, the number that you've just suggested is like a perfect match for what the current mandate says. If we had 75% trans transporting themselves and we could do 25, then we would be, um, you know, good to go. And you also need to consider that if we're in a hybrid model, um, we're not talking about bringing right. that same volume in every day too. So, right, of course. you know, so again, we certainly don't want to put an undue burden on anyone who is not able to do that. Um, but if there are some folks um, who can, that would certainly be helpful. And then I think um, probably everybody knows this, but I have experienced some frustration at drop off and pick up with my kids <laughs> at some of the schools. So I'm just wondering um, how, what accommodations are gonna be made to, to have that, that much of an increase in drop-offs and, and um, pickups? Oh, I know. Or have you none not talked your, about that? Oh, oh I know none of your frustration has ever been at no, wet birth Hillary. Never, never, never Kelly. Well-oiled machine. Uh -huh. um, we have actually had some conversations about that and that it's almost like we need the opposite right now. There'll be fewer buses, more car riders. So Wentworth has some um, options in terms of like perhaps looking at the bus loop now becoming the parent drop-off loop and opening up the access road for buses and those pieces. So it, it's, you know, the plan isn't perfectly um, created yet because we need the data and the numbers to know exactly what we're looking at. But every school site has its challenges, um, but it's certainly something that we have begun exploring and problem solving. And then just in terms of K-5, the pickup for um, K-5 has parents coming into the building. I assume that's something we would want to avoid. And so that probably also has to be looked at. And then... Correct. So it's like okay. the reverse, right? Yeah. And that, okay. that kind of, just to piggyback off of that, it kind of goes back to our scheduling and, you know, looking at some staggered drop off and arrival. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then regarding the, the diagrams for the classes, do we know um, this, I don't, this might be a Diane question, but do we know, like, what number of students would need to be in each class? to accommodate having the hybrid model, right? Where like, where like um, basically half the students are in school at a time. Like, so, cause I was just, when I was looking at the pictures, I think um, Brem had said, you know, here's a picture of what it would look like if it was six feet of distancing and that allowed for nine, I forget, nine desks and three feet allowed for 15 desks. So do we know like how many or an, approximately how many kids we would need to accommodate per class? I mean, I guess we, we won't know who is doing distance learning, but I just am looking for a, a, a close, something close. Or yeah. if you know that. Don, actually, if you could forward to the next slide or I guess it's Kelly, right? Kelly, do you have the slide deck? So, you know, again, if you look at, if we're staying within six feet distancing, the ranges in all of our schools right now are between nine and 13. If we think about the hybrid model and about 50% of our students coming in um, mm -hmm. on A days and 50% coming in on B days, um, that aligns pretty closely with what our, you know, with what half of our class size is. Okay, great, that's what I was. Yeah. Asking. Um, and then, sorry, I have one more question. So I'm, I, and this is probably for Mike. Um, so this is like a two part question. Can we assume that if we're red, that we're not going to be having, after, we're not going to be having any after school sports or activities? Number uh -huh. one, wait, I'll just, and then number two, number two is, I mean, you know, at the very beginning, we were talking about situations where um, because of like local um, numbers, we might be red, whereas, you know, some of the districts we play might be yellow or green or vice versa. And I assume that that's, that's going to wreak havoc on the schedules if there were sports. And I, I didn't know what the how you would what you had done to look at that. Well, the, the league and the state is looking at scheduling now 
And obviously that's gonna change dramatically because of the late start date. So they've already just talked about um, doing quite a few less games per sport already um, because of not starting till September 8th with the first play date being September 18th, when normally our first play date is in August. Um, and so that's kind of changed schedules already. And as they look at schedules, they're looking at regionalization of schedules as well. And so, um, you know, we may be playing some teams that we don't normally play. We may be playing cross conference teams, but um, we would, we'd likely be playing teams within our same geographic region as well. So if there was an impact, it would probably be, it would probably impact everybody. And to the question about red, I, I, I hate to say, I'm guessing that, but I hate to say, um, you know, succinctly about it, I, you know, because every day something different comes up. And so you never know what, um, what folks are going to, you know, decide to do and, and what is best. So our goal is certainly to make sure that we provide the safest environment for our students and, and, and staff. And um, so those decisions will, will be made, you know, as, as, as that happens. I'm going to guess, though, that you're right. Probably if we're in the red, it, we'd probably be taking a break. All right. Thanks, everyone. April? So I was on the transportation subcommittee for the start um, committee, and so I just wanted to bring up something that Sarah had said, which would be a board issue, um, which was she had said that one thing that they may, may, may need to take into consideration is our policy on which um, students in Scarborough we do transport, because we have a policy which dictates how far you have to live from a school and how far you have to be from a specific bus stop. Um, in order to receive transportation. And I got the impression, um, and someone correct me please if I'm wrong, but I got the impression that there's um, not a lot of enforcement of that policy happening in some places. Um, and so Sarah had said to our subcommittee that, you know, one thing that we may need to look at as a board and, and as a policy committee was um, our policies around transportation too. So that's something to put a pin in for or maybe later on in August when we get the results of the survey back. Thank you, April. Um, Mike, I have a couple questions for you. When it comes to choosing whether or not a sport, you know, a season is on or off, is it, is there a chance that it could be sport by sport? That they could determine that one sport has a higher chance of risk than another does? Or is it an all in, all out? I can tell you right now what they're planning for with athletics is they, there was a proposal um, originally to mix up the sports. Um, so play what they considered lower risk sports um, in the fall and then, you know, amp that up as the year went on. Um, that, that was decided that that was not going to happen in Maine that in Maine, if we were to do activities, they were going to be the normal seasonal activities that were always offered during that time. Um, again, because things are ever changing, I, I don't know if I can answer yes or no, but my best guess is that, um, you know, there may very well be some sports that they say, um, we just don't see how we can do this. Um, and then there may be some sports that they say, you know, we can absolutely do this. Um, but again, um, where things are, are changing so much, I, I don't know if I can fully answer that. Fair enough. Um, and then the last question I had had to do more with um, like doctor sign-offs and every two years, students have to turn those forms in. Is there any thought of maybe extending that um, for another year as not everybody can get in or some doctors aren't seeing patients right now? We do, we do have a section on our webpage that talks specifically about that. Um, what we've done in our registration uh, document is 
we have increased the number of questions in the health section of our family ID registration for um, athletics. That what that did was it, it allowed us to uh, meet the requirement of um, completing a health history form. So instead of doing a separate form for that, we embedded it in our registration for this year. So when people fill out their registration, they're going to be answering more health questions than they normally have had. But at the end of that, they'll have completed the health history form. There was an MPA rule that said that um, if you could not, if, the, if the, it was absolutely out of the question to get a physical, that as long as student athletes completed a health history form and that health history form was then reviewed by our athletic trainer and school nurses. And if they were not any medical indicators, um, then we would, we would approve participation for that season. It's really on a season by season basis with the physicals. Um, the expectation certainly still is that every student has a physical every two years, but there is a bit of a loophole, I guess, for lack of a better word, that would account for a student not being excluded um, because they absolutely just could not get in to see their doctor. We've also worked out a, a deal with Maine Medical Partners um, and Maine Medical Partners. It appears as if we're still working on the finishing touches of this, but it appears as if that the doctors from the Maine Medical Partners group would provide sports physicals for our student athletes if it came to that and they needed it. For example, if there was a pre-existing condition for a student, then they would be required to have a physical before they would be allowed to participate. If they still couldn't get in to see their doctor, then we would probably align them with a doctor from Maine Medical Partners. All right, thank you very much. April? Oh, sorry, your hand is back up. I just hadn't noticed that. All right, any other questions for operations? Okay. All right, so just to wrap us up here in terms of next steps, um, and we've talked about these things uh, sprinkled along the way, uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, um, we are, we will be putting together a parent survey uh, to send out next week uh, to be asking people to give us information about uh, what their decision will be for the start of school um, and also uh, what their plans are for transportation. Um, uh, at the school level, uh, building leaders are conducting staff forums and, um, you know, central office leadership and um, HR folks are gonna be sitting in on those as well uh, so that we can answer and be responsive to uh, questions that might be coming up for staff. Uh, we are going to be collecting and posting all of these great FAQs um, and putting them up on the web so that uh, there is a treasure trove of resources, did you know, uh, for the fall, uh, for our plans, um, and then some parent forms as well. Excellent. Um, thank you. This was incredibly comprehensive. Um, it was so thorough. I really appreciate the I can and only imagine the number of hours that went into creating this document. Um, so thank you. And I would just say we have an amazing community here because um, you know we we don't. It's not just the people who are on this screen tonight, our building leaders who did this work. This is the work of our staff, our students, our parents, community members. Um, there's a lot of heart for Scarborough, and I think that's what you see here. I would agree. All right. Um, okay. Moving into new business. First thing on the agenda is a motion to approve the START framework as presented tonight. 
So moved. So moved. Second. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, so I'd like to limit us just a little bit if possible. Um, but if anyone has anything that they'd like to say. I will. Nick? The only thing I want to say is that um, I think it's great when we can start a process like this by opening up just a large number of people. I know there were at least 100 people involved in these different committees. I was on the health one as much as I could be. And a number of people just on that one with the wide breadth of expertise we had from pediatricians to parents to health experts to people that were on the national committees that are talking about this. To come to this plan at this point is an incredible amount of work to try and winnow down all that expertise. And so I just want to echo what, what Leanne said and say thank you and, and also say thank you for opening this to community input so early in the process. I think it really helps us to, to gain some buy-in and bring anxiety down when a large number of people can be involved and be productive in the way they were. Great. April? Um, thanks, Leanne. I, I really struggled this week, this month, this year um, with these opening plans and what we were going to do and what I'm going to, what decisions um, I'm going to make for my three children who are in the district. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that people understand, um, you know, just how much thought and consideration went into these plans. I also want to say thank you to everybody who gave up their precious summer hours for the start committee. Um, and so I'm going to be supporting the plans um, as presented even though there are still a million questions. Um, and I know that we have to be fluid. Um, and I trust that the administration is doing everything they can to answer everyone's questions and do what is in the best interest of all of our kids. Um, my one request would be that from now until the start of school, we, I feel like the community just needs to hear more. Um, we just need more communication, even if it's just a, a, a quick check-in from Sandy or Dan, um, you know, just letting the community know where we are in the process, um, what deadlines are coming up, things like that, um, just so that people feel really connected because we have been disconnected for so long now um, that I feel like in order to really come together as a district when we reopen the schools, that um, that, that communication really is going to be critical. I agree. Sarah? Thanks, Leanne. Um, I also just wanted to thank you guys for your hard work um, and, you know, for everyone in the community that participated, volunteered their time and participated in these committees. Um, I was feeling pretty anxious about tonight and then, you know, received the the plan um, ahead of time and very quickly was, was put to at ease because I realized how much thought and thoroughness went into the plan. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think just, I will also, as April said, I'll also be supporting this. I know that there's a lot of questions that are still outstanding, but as, you know, we have to put the stake in the ground somewhere and we're doing that tonight. And, and um, other, after we do this, you guys can go and sort of answer the other questions. I think, um, you know, just reading through some of the emails that we've gotten and then just thinking about um, the teacher needs, I, I'll also be supporting the decision to push back the school, the start of the school year to give teachers more time to plan. I guess I would just ask for maybe, um, you know, we're saying that we're, we should be flexible and nimble and be able to adapt. And I guess I would just ask for that same consideration for teachers, depending on how they feel at the end or even in the middle of that training process, if they feel like they're ready. Um, I don't think anybody will ever feel like 100% ready, but I think getting a gauge from them as to how they feel um, in those, you know, that first week and if it, if they're not comfortable, what we can do and, and whether that means a further delay or whatever. But I think, you know, we need our staff to be 100% on board in order for this to work for our students. So I guess I would just ask for that additional consideration. Thank you. Hillary? Uh, I just wanted to kind of echo what everybody else said and, and thank all the people. I know there were parents and teachers and nurses and 
um, our staff, all kinds of staff members and everybody who came together. Um, I think it is an advantage that we had such a large group um, that was able to come together and make some of these recommendations. Um, and I, I also um, agree with what April said. I, I think that it's important to realize that the, that the, the plan tonight, which I will be supporting, is a is like a jumping off point, kind of like Sarah said, and that we don't have all the questions answered, um, and and that's okay. We you know things change. Like I mean, I think things are probably going to be changing by tomorrow, um, but that this provides kind of a general framework that um, that I'm happy with thus far, um, and that I know there's a lot more work to happen and. Um, and as things change, different decisions might need to be made. And I think our supporting this tonight doesn't um, doesn't mean that that those decisions can't be made um, based on any new information that comes out, um, or that things can't change based on um, questions that might have been answered or things that might not have gone the way um, you expected them to. So uh, I just wanted to um, say that again, and that's that goes to that fluidity. Um, and the fact that we're appro approving this plan doesn't doesn't um, take away from the fluidity that is going to need to be in place. Thank you, Kristen. I don't have much to add that hasn't been said, but I did want to say thank you for making the start committee and to everyone that served on it. It was it's great to have all that input. Um, and you know, I, I'll support the plan too, as much as we all want the answers to all the questions, it's just not possible. But I have every confidence that you are going to get those answers when we need them. So thanks for all the hard work. Alicia? I'd just like to um, uh, echo and encourage the um, continuous communication of the the plan and I think that that will go a long way to help alleviate anxiety um, because people are looking for answers and I know we can't give them certainty but I think that the the best we can do is communicate to them even if it is um, that we don't have all of the answers and so I would just ask that that occur on sort of an ongoing basis and I, I would also really love to see like a, a check-in um, a month or so after we start school to to see um, where people are and make sure that um, things are working so we don't get too far down the road. And I would just ask um, parents to be patient as well with the process because um, of all of the hard work that everybody has done. Thank you for all of that. And, and know that we're putting our teachers in on the front lines of, of of this and the stress that they're going through a lot of them with trying to to raise their own kids and and so this is going to be a really difficult time for them and and stressful and it's not going to be perfect and so um i just i just hope that you know you see national headlines and in, in statewide nobody's happy with any of the solutions and i think we're going to feel that in this in in the school district as well and i just hope that people recognize that there's only imperfect solutions here. Thank you. Um, I really want to echo what everyone has said. Um, the thank yous can't be enough. Um, but I'd also like to thank each of the board members. The questions tonight were really thoughtful. They were excellent. They were on topic. Um, reminder to the community, if you have questions, as Diane mentioned, there is going to be a running FAQ. Um, please send them to the board. We will make sure that they're getting on that document. Um, we'll make sure that there's communication that's out there on where to find the FAQs so that you can keep up to date on where things are in, as we're moving forward. Um, and to the staff, thank you so much for putting all of this together as well as for hosting both a staff forum um, and a parent forum in order to have that opportunity to hear the direct feedback from all of the constituents. Um, I'm also in support of this. I think this is this is a great place to begin from. Um, and with that, Diane, if we could do the roll call vote. Sure. Ms. Dorgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? 
Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. Um, 7.2 is a modification to the 2020-2021 school calendar. I know that we've heard a um, couple of allusions to what that's going to be, but if Diane or Sandy, if you want to tee up what that will be. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so given the reinventing of our schools, we are recommending that our staff have September 1, 2, and three as a days for planning. Um, currently, what you passed last spring was those would be student days, but we are recommending that we turn those over to being staff days. Given all the reports that you heard tonight, uh, the academics, the health, operations, all of that work really needs to be front loaded and more time would be absolutely wonderful. If you could support that, that would be great. In addition to that, and if I'm going too fast, let me know, um, what we would recommend that we cancel the October 9th and the March 12th professional development days and make those student days. Thirdly, we would request that you take out late start time from September to December, and we would anticipate that maybe we're going to be in a hybrid model. Uh, we don't know. But also to consider that from January to June, we would have a late start. Now, that could change depending upon what schools look like from January to June. So again, let me just quickly review uh, the student days currently that were what that are on the calendar is September 1, 2, and 3. We're recommending that that be teacher days, teacher training days, working on protocols, working on technology training, all the things that you heard tonight. And secondly, that we cancel October 9th and 12th as professional development days and make those stu two student days. So what that does really in effect, it gives you, we've lost one student day out of the whole calendar, just so you're clear on that. And again, uh, we would take out the late start from September to December, and we would still have the late start from January to June. However, that could change as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Motion to approve the 2020 2021 school calendar as presented. So moved. Second. And discussion. April? Nope. Sorry. I okay. I'm on my phone, and so my interface isn't what I'm used to. All right. Well, I was going to say, if you need to, just raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on you. Uh, Nick? So I just want to clear, clarify that the calendar before I had 177 student days and 882 staff days. There are still going to be 182 staff days, but we're down to 176 students. So basically, we've gone from a 177.5 to a 170. 177.5 to 176.6, is that right? That's correct. Okay, that's all I needed. Okay. Kristen? I, I support all of these changes and I am really glad to see the pushback of the start date on here. I can't tell you how many times in those start meetings we talk about like a really great idea and it was like, oh, that's also going to need PD. That's going to need PD. We're going to need more time to do this. And I really, really think that that's going to be a great investment of time so that when the students do come back to the building, the teachers will feel comfortable. They'll have hopefully everything set in place and that's only going to benefit the students. Okay. Alicia? I just want to clarify that this was um, a recommendation made by the, the committee. It 
there was input from several of the people throughout those groups talking about particularly the, the opening of the school day, yes. Okay, I mean, I, I support the, you know, the work of the committee and the rationale for it. I, I worry about the impact to families, but obviously our priority is um, being prepared for, for school. And I just wanted to confirm that that was the recommendation. Thank you. Hillary? Um, I, I mean, I, I definitely support pushing the start date back. Um, I mean, you hate to lose student days, but um, I think that the value of having more time for the teachers to be prepared outweighs that. I, I'm concerned that it's, it's still not enough time. Um, it's, you know, that's three extra days. Um, well, actually, yeah, it was, it's only three extra days. Um, and I just, you know, we're asking teachers to do a lot and to make a lot of changes um, and um, just to their practice, but then also just to the way they interact with, you know, their building and their schools. And so that all requires professional development, like Kristen said, um, in addition to planning, you know, for themselves and with their, um, with their colleagues. Um, I, I just, I don't know if I would take away the October professional development day. Um, I feel like that could be really useful, basically a month into school um, to see, to, you know, just for teachers to check in if there's any additional professional development that needs to happen or just um, additional planning um, that they, they find that they might need. Uh, so I just, I guess that's kind of my only thing. I, I'm fine with um, removing the late starts because it, they're basically being replaced by the Wednesday afternoons um, that teachers will have to plan. But I do think that uh, we should consider keeping the October professional development day. Oh, Kristen? and sorry, oh, I sorry. just wanted to add too that um, I'll be very interested in hearing about whether the state waives the minimum requirements for student days, because that also will have a big effect on what we can do with the calendar. Yeah. Kristen? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, Hillary brings up a good point about the October day that it might be useful. How much, have we heard from the teachers how much those Wednesday afternoons are gonna satisfy what they need to do as we start the beginning of the year. Does that, would that be enough for them? Perhaps a couple that's, principles. That's three and a half hours a week, right? That they'll have, and I, and I don't get me wrong, I think they can use endless time right now, but do we know how they feel about that, the October? I would refer to the principals if, if one of them could just jump in on and mention. Right, well, I can, I can just speak to the, the weekly time that we spent together during distance learning and, um, you know, the grade level time that we were able to, to spend. And I know, you know, Kelly Crosby mentioned this in our leadership meeting the other day that that was invaluable time that especially at K-5, we're not able to have um, due to the, the way that K-5 teachers, you know, they teach everything and they're not able necessarily to meet for, for long periods of time every week together. And that was something we were able to do during distance learning was really have dedicated time to meet. And that's what they're really gonna need is weekly time to meet together and plan, whether that's in a building or across buildings. Um, so, you know, on top of the front loading piece of, of PD to get up and, and running, um, I think those Wednesdays are gonna be really valuable. And um, we did talk about that a little bit in our smaller groups um, about having some kind of a, of, whether it was a Friday or a Wednesday, but some kind of time um, to kind of debrief and, and talk about how things are going and what, you know, how we're gonna plan. And um, so, you know, while we don't have all of that feedback from all of our, all of our teachers right now, 
um, I can add that perspective from from K five. At the, at the middle. Oh, oh, sorry. Ditto everything that Kelly M M said, but also add that it's so critical to have it at the same time for everybody because now more than ever we're going to need to be able to connect across phase levels because what we've always um, expected students to enter with for example um, will look different this year so those conversations class by class and teacher by teacher are going to be critical and having the designated time to do that in addition to grade level meeting time um, is is a need for teachers and i've never heard a teacher say oh we've got way too much planning time uh at the middle school uh, teachers can always use more time but this three and a half hours will add a lot at the middle school teachers will still have their time built into the schedule to meet also and we will also still have our monday professional development after school. So there's some teacher design time, our staff meeting, and then curriculum committee time. I'm sorry if that came out wrong. I meant, will that be enough to sort of take away that October day? Like, I don't, I, like, would it, would they prefer it? And I think it's fine. I think it's fine to take that October day. I, I do. I think when we brought the proposal forward, we did not feel comfortable bringing a proposal forward that would require a waiver when that hasn't been granted to us yet. But certainly if that is the will of the board, uh, you get to make those decisions. Um, I do just also wanna say that I'm pretty sure there's PD that we had approved a couple meetings ago that start on the 25th and 26th of August for teachers. So this would be three additional days um, on top of those. And to echo what both um, Kristen and Hillary said, it would be interesting if we get the waivers, even if we don't, again, will of the board and all of that. If the teachers want that October 12th PD day, I would not be opposed to it. I think that um, this is, a very different situation and they may come back and say that they need more and I would never want to not give the staff that time for development if it's necessary. Um, so I would be flexible for that. Um, just wanted to put that out there. Hillary? Is the minimum not 175 days? Uh, that is the minimum. But there are some other things. Um, so, what would we need a waiver for if we kept the October date? We'd be at 175 student days. Currently, yes. Right. Um, I think we're ready to vote. All right, Ms. Durgan. Well, I don't I don't want to take the October date away, but I don't want to vote no because I Can we because imagine? I agree I agree with um with moving the start date back. Move to amend it. Yeah. Oh. Can I do that now or is it too late? Can you take back the call to the vote? <laughs> For you, yes, I will take back the call to a vote. All right, so I guess I'd like to amend that the calendar, um, we accept the calendar as printed, except for the October um, professional development day would remain a professional development day. Second. Discussion? I, guess, I, your, sorry, your, I, yeah. I, I said everything I already wanted to say. I guess I would be very interested in finding out um, whether uh, teachers feel that that day is valuable as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, either way, we might 
be in the position of having to change the calendar again. So uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I just, right. before, I move, before I move on, I just want to make sure you were finished. You kind of stopped like half sentence. I know. No, I'm done. Sorry. Okay. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, I think you had started to say something. I, I think putting my teacher hat on, I think teachers would love to have that day in October. Um, they work really hard. There's never truly enough staff development time in any school system. So I can't imagine that they would not welcome that. And um, I think that would be very supportive of the board if uh, you vote that in. Thank you. April? Uh, my only concern is just that now we're at 175 days. Um, and, and so if there is no waiver presented at the state level, um, this would be the first time in as long as I can ever remember that we approved a calendar that had the bare minimum number of student days. So that makes me a little um, apprehensive, I guess. But this is also an insane time and I can appreciate the circumstances that we are in. And I am also um, open to the idea that that staff development is going to be more needed and more um, critical uh, to our staff than maybe necessarily an, an added student day. So that's my two cents. <laughs> okay. Nick? Needed. I'm not muted. Um, I, I agree with April. I'm a little, I'm a challenge to bring it down to 175 for, for the reason that she stated, but also regardless of how much planning and how much work and how much innovation we do with a hybrid model or online model, or even some version of normalcy, even though I think we know the green light won't really be normal, even if it's a green light, our days aren't going to probably be as productive as they would normally be because of all the transition and all the change and that just brings anxiety to students and staff and everyone. So I worry about bringing the total number of days down when in the back of my head, I'm also thinking there's no way that the days in this fall will be the same as the days in previous falls because of what we're all accommodating just to figure out how we, how every day even looks. So to bring the number of days down to the bare minimum, also knowing that the, I don't want to say the quality because that's not the right word, but the the amount you're going to be able to do in a day is going to be reduced probably as well. Okay. Kristen? Um, I agree with that point, Nick, that it probably will be less productive, but I would argue sort of on the flip side of that, that Though a day off for these students after what they are going to be enduring for the beginning of school, it might not be the worst thing in the world for them to also have that time. I mean, just knowing, and I know it's not going to be like the spring, but it's emotionally draining, especially on some of these little kids, or maybe I just feel especially because I have little kids, but it's a lot for them. And I, as a parent, I would welcome another day off. I agree with you though. It's, we're losing more productivity, but. Um, I will say I'm in support of the amendment as well. I think that to Sandy's point, there are never enough hours for professional development. Um, so I just think that it's, we need this. If the staff comes back and um, during those staff forums says, nope, we don't need it. I'd happily put this back on the calendar um, to address it again. Um, but I don't want to take something away um, that I think has benefit. And looking at the clock, um, if we're comfortable and ready to go for a vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalotis? Yes. 
Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Motion passes. Um, I am adding something real the quick amendment. to Mm -mm. And just the just the uh, Hillary's amendment passed. The main yes. motion is still on the table. Thank you. I am so glad that you are okay. um, at that. So now moving back to the main motion, we can vote on the main motion. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Wait, wait, I'm voting for the the calendar, we just approved the calendar as amended by Hillary's motion. And then Correct. now we're voting on the calendar as Sandy first proposed it. No, you just approved the, you just approved that the amendment and now you're voting on it as amended. Correct. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Gill. Even though I didn't love the amendment, I agree with the rest of it. So yes. <laughs> Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Excellent. Um, and now under policy BE, I am asking for the board to extend um, our meeting beyond the 930 time to finish um, all of the new business that is still ahead of us tonight. So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> Begrudgingly. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Sorry, yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Max. I promise I'm going to hustle. It's um, cool. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it looks like beautiful where you are. I'm hoping that there's stars. And... It's lovely, actually. I don't mind this at all. It is lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, 7.3 is our initial determination on the school reopening. And what this does, this is while we know tomorrow starts, the information that comes from the state and that would really set us um, in motion to determine are we yellow, are we red, are we green? Um, the board needs to set that first stage. And then moving forward every two weeks, as we've heard through the presentation, um, Sandy is going to be the one to make that determination of what's going to happen next. Um, but we do need to set that first parameter, kind of the benchmark of where we are. Um, so I'm just going to ask either Diane or Sandy to share that if school was opening tomorrow, what would the statistics tell us and what would the color be that you would recommend our district be in to set that first stage? Well, you know, tomorrow, Department of Ed will be putting out an announcement, I think around lunchtime, on how we fall as far as yellow, red, or green. And that will determine how we move forward. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I had to speculate, I would say we may fall in the yellow. And, um, but I, uh, that's just my opinion. I have no data to really support that. Diane, you want to jump in on adding anything? The thing I would just add would be um, when they first talked to us about this metric, which is probably right around two weeks ago, um, I had gone online to see where Cumberland County fit in the metric. Um, and at the time, I'll admit I haven't had a minute this week to look to see where <laughs> we are. Um, but at the time, um, we were at three point seven people per 100,000 um, in terms of the rate of infection for COVID. Uh, and that puts us in the yellow range according to the metric because the yellow range of the metric is between one 
and 10 cases per 100,000. And it would appear from everything I see on the news that uh, we're holding pretty steady, maybe declining a little bit, but not, uh, you know, not much difference. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I go to make this motion, I want it to be really clear that this is not necessarily what we're going to be when we start school. Starting tomorrow, Sandy will be able to send out communication to our families to say, this is where we are. And based on the every two week cycle, we may see three more announcements in those communications that we could change or we could stay consistent. Um, but this is really just the board setting the stage so that from moving forward as of tomorrow, hopefully noontime, um, Sandy will own all of that communication going forward. Um, so with that said, I am making a motion to um, the school reopening under the yellow model as presented tonight. Move to approve. Second. And discussion. Why, why do we have to choose one today? Um, because based under the information that had come out with um, the governor's meeting and in talking with Sandy and Diane, the board needed to set that stage. And we will not be setting that stage moving forward. Um, the district will determine where we are, but we really needed to provide that initial guideline of where we were as a district for starting school. Okay, well, I guess I'll just say, I I mean, I thought that the, the you know, we, we did approve the framework for red, yellow, or green. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm comfortable with Sandy and Diane making that decision as needed as, or as information changes. I guess I will say that um, I, I am, I would like to see our, I know that, sorry, <laughs> I didn't plan for this one. Um, so I guess my point is that I know that the, the, the metric that gets released by the state as to whether our county is red, yellow, or green is not a directive, um, but I would be very uncomfortable going lower than what that status is um, just as a district. Um, so meaning that I would be very uncomfortable with yellow if the Cumberland County metric was red. Um, and I also just wanted to clarify again that as it stands with the, with the um, recommendations that are in place today, we don't have an option of being green because we don't have the space to accommodate that. So really our options are, as of today, in, unless recommendations change, are yellow and red. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I would say yes, is that's that, Is that everybody's understanding? Okay, I just wanna make sure my understanding matches yeah. with everybody else's understanding. Yeah. Alicia? Can you repeat your motion? Sure, my motion is that the board is recommending that the initial determination of the school reopening is yellow, and then moving forward, all decisions would be made by the superintendent on what our color is, based on the guidelines from the state. So the, our, we're voting on our color as of today, which may change tomorrow. Correct. And we're authorizing the superintendent to make that decision, even if it's inconsistent with the statewide governance? No, he would follow the statewide governance, but moving forward, he would be responsible for communicating out on a biweekly basis what that guidance is. So similar to how he had communicated in the spring um, where we were and, you know, we needed a week, we needed two weeks, 
we're going to remain remote for the remainder of the spring. He would continue to make those decisions. It would not come back to the board to determine what we're going to do with what we hear from the state. Okay. I, I mean, I just want to be clear, as long as we're, the expectation is that we're following the CDC rec and DOE recommendations, then that's Absolutely. Okay. Obviously, I support. April? Um, I, yeah, I just want to say, like, a, a fairly clear case, I think, was presented tonight for us being um, at best in the yellow. And if we determine um, or get guidelines from the state that Cumberland County's numbers are not um, something that would warrant a, a yellow from the state, then, you know, uh, we're authorizing Sandy to, you know, make those changes accordingly. But for tonight, you know, I, I really think yellow is kind of um, the only option. And I think that it helps the community um, to understand where we're at and start their planning process and to have a realistic expectation um, of what the opening of schools is going to look like, you know, with us setting this initial standard tonight. Great. Thank you. And Nick? I always have to check. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, I was actually just looking at the, the data and, and what Diane was saying. And uh, Cumberland County, we have just over 2,000 confirmed cases. And that converts to, if you look at the actual conversion per million people, it's 7,100, 7,200 cases per million. So I think that pretty squarely, that's today's stats, pretty squarely puts us in the yellow um, from what I've read about it. So I'm completely comfortable with that designation. And then moving forward, I mean, even if Cumberland County, we've talked about this already, even if Cumberland County went green, you know, in a, in, a, in a week or two, we're not ready to go green. And so that's why I think it's so important that we use that data as, as guidance and we allow our leadership to decide how we move forward. I mean, ultimately, I wouldn't be comfortable with us being more cavalier than the color would tell us to be. And I think we can all agree with that because our, our student safety is number one. But if we're just sitting and looking at the data we have available tonight before we hear from the governor tomorrow, I think yellow makes the most sense. It's the best we can do anyway, uh, given the resources that we have. Thank you. Okay. I think we're ready to vote, Diane. Ms. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. All right, 7.4, Sandy is the high school mural. Thank you. And get some slides coming up. So a little history here when I came on board, um, I soon learned that we had changed the high school mascot probably about tw 20 years ago. And, um, you know, through connecting with people and learning and listening, um, I did come to the board and uh, mentioned about the Scarborough High School uh, picture that is in the plumber gym. So that's what I'm here to talk about tonight, and I'm just going to go through my bullets and uh, certainly try to make this informative and, and put the knowledge out there about my recommendation. So again, the mascot name was Redskins, and that started in 1938, and it went to the board to be changed um, on September 21st, 2000. As a reminder, I know the board knows this, and to the public, LD 9, 944 is an act to ban Native American mascots in all public schools. And that was passed by the le legislature in May 16, 2019. And I think if you're in tune with other districts like Wells and places up north, you know, it was obviously. Um, quite public about when people were changing those mascots, and I'm sure that was very public here in Scarborough as well. The third bullet, uh, Robert Scammon, 
who was an art teacher, uh, a good soul, actually took it upon himself to paint a Native American image in the Plumber Gym at the high school where it still exists. An Indian head reproduction was removed from the outside of the high school when the mascot name was changed to Red Storm. We go on to the next slide. I put up some assumptions. First assumption is currently we're living where peaceful protests are sweeping the nation and racism must end in all communities. Second assumption, we stand strong with being a welcome and inclusive environment for all. Third assumption, heritage and tradition are not sufficient reasons to keep an offensive symbol. Fourth assumption, the picture of the red skin is offensive to community. And last bullet, red skin does symbolize racism. On the third slide, a little history, if you remember, legal counsel from Drummond and Woodson came to one of our board meetings in the fall of 19, 2019. And, this, and, and the attorney said the following, the school board is exposing itself and the town to have legal challenges by leaving this red skin painting in the gym. It is offensive. The image depicts a Native American individual. It violates, it violates the spirit of the law because it represents back to when, in fact, the mural was a mascot of Scarborough High School. The public display of the American image painted at Scarborough High School Plummet Gym Wall has been repeatedly been offensive to members of the community. Upon review of this, I sat down with five or six individuals. So sometimes I like to test my assumptions. I like to test my thinking before I go public. And so I just like to recognize that Isabel Lou, who was a junior, was on a small committee. We met two times with Jackie Perry, former board member. In fact, she was here when they changed the mascot. Principal Susan Ketch, Assistant Principal Jake Brown, AD Director Michael Gage, and then also Leanne was able to come into our meeting by phone. Again, it wasn't so much to ask them if they felt that this is the way to go. I gave them my recommendation and I listened and I got feedback. It was one more step for me to get input before coming to you as a board. It is my recommend, recommendation to the board at this time that the painting be removed. And um, I would also add, I don't have a lot of information yet, but Isabel Liu, our junior, uh, has some ideas of maybe taking a picture of that and putting it in a history component of the high school. It, it could be a learning experience. She just had some ideas generated in her head and, and uh, I would encourage her to work with administration at the high school if there's a way that they feel that they would like to somehow capture that in, in a different way. Um, but I'm not, I'm not gonna get involved in that at this point in time. Basically, my recommendation is the board to remove it and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Nick? So I'm one of three Scarborough alumni on the board. Two of us graduated as Redskins and, and one of us graduated as a Red Storm, uh, if, I'm doing my, if I'm doing my numbers right. And I've had a lot of conversations with people since this last came up on the board uh, about the, uh, about the the Native American likeness. And there's a couple of things that I want to say. First, the one, one thing that was misconstrued with some of our members of our community was that this was the original mural from the original gym. It's not. 
this is actually a reproduction of the original mural that was in the original gym, which has been the music room for over 30 years. So when people remember that gym and, and feel like this is painting over that piece of history, that piece of history has actually been gone for a long time. So when I explained that, they were like, oh. Um, but this Native American likeness is a likeness of a, of a mascot that a lot of us remember. And I'll always remember it. I'll always have those memories. I'll always have my yearbooks, and my varsity jacket, and all of those things. Um, but when I think about the behavior that we innocently displayed 20 plus years ago, the chanting in the bleachers, the senior member, the member of the senior class that had to dress up in basically war paint and run around the gym. You would never do that today. You wouldn't even think about it. So you live and you learn. And when I look at this, that's what I, that's what I think. I think we live and we learn as a community. And we learned this lesson over 20 years ago. And this is a remnant piece of that history that I think it's, it's time to put to rest. Um, and I love the idea of preserving it. I love the idea of preserving its likeness and, and paying tribute to that piece of history but also taking it off the wall of the gymnasium because it's not who our school is today. And I think we should be proud of that evolution. I'll admit that in 2001, when I was in college and heard about it, I was a little miffed, but that was 20 years ago. And we've all grown and, and I agree with the superintendent's recommendation and I'll be supporting its removal. Max? I'm actually um, really glad to hear you say that, Nick. I was very, um, nervous admittedly going into this because I know at the last meeting I or the initial meeting where we talked about this there was some like people with differing opinions about like what this means and everything and I'm really glad that like you I, that I agree with you I think it's very inappropriate and it should definitely be removed I think that it's like I was trying to explain it to someone and because they didn't really see eye to eye with me they didn't understand my rationale and I think the only way I can really describe it is that it's almost analogous to like if our mascot was like a slave and we had a photo or like a painting of a slave on our wall even though it wasn't our mascot anymore like it is pretty much the same thing like it's just very racist whatever I think it's really good that we are acknowledging this issue you know i've been a part of the anti-racism coalition that did meet with mr prince and um i'm really glad to see our district heading in this direction of actually like taking initiative on issues and really facing this head on i think it's a really good direction for us hillary um so I, um, I wrote a couple things down because I did not say what I wanted to say the last time this came up. Um, I think, sorry, let me just get my statement if I can find it. Um, I just, I, I I think that um, this should definitely be removed. I can't find my statement, of course. Um, hold on just one second. Does somebody else wanna go? Yeah, Sarah, if you wanna pop in and then Sorry. when you're done, Hillary, if you can. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't have much to say other than I agree it should be removed I guess I just don't know I think we've said I think a, a couple of times that this is not a board decision so I, I don't know necessarily that we need to vote on it um but if if Sandy if you feel like you need the support of the board in order to do that then you know, if you have that support I absolutely think it should be removed um everything that Max said did a So, sorry, do you want me to go, Leanne? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I, I think it needs to be removed. I found it increasingly difficult to abide the fact that the offensive image remains on our school property. Uh, we've been told not only that it's offensive, but that it also violates the spirit of the law. Um, 
And we have been assured that the image is offensive and damaging. We've also been told that students don't feel welcome in our school. Um, and I think that, um, I, I agree that I don't think it's a board level decision. It should have just been removed when the um, name was changed. Um, but again, if you need my support, it should absolutely be removed. Um, and I don't think that it needs to remain in any shape or form um, in in the historical society or a picture in the in the um, in the high school or anything of the sort. Um, it was inappropriate, no matter what the intentions were. Um, and now that we know better, we should do better. Thank you, April. Um, I didn't intend to say very much, um, but a couple of other comments of spurred me to make sure that everyone knows my position. Um, so and when this conversation first came up, Leanne, you were absent and I was chairing the meeting for the first time ever. Um, and this delicate topic got brought up. And I think in my um, wanting to make this feel like a discussion that the community was a part of and not just a decision that seven people were making without having had the discussion. I think some people got the impression that I was in favor of keeping um, the mural, which I am absolutely not in favor of keeping the mural. I 100% agree and believe that this is something that needs to be removed. I also don't necessarily believe that it's a board um, decision that we need to vote on. Um, but I did at the time, and I stand by this, um, think that we are better as a community for having these conversations. Um, and part of our role as the school board is to, you know, further these conversations with the community and be the ambassadors between the district and the community. And so I'm glad and I'm proud that Sandy um, took our advice and sought um, some conversations with some members of our um, student population. Um, and thank you, Sandy, for bringing this forward again um, for public discussion. Thank you. Alicia? Sandy, I love the assumptions that you had. Um, I thought that they really reflected where we are and, and why. Um, I support your decision. I Again, we heard from um, Melissa Huey that it's not a, a board decision. Um, so I, I also don't think that we should be voting on it, but I do support your decision. Um, the arguments that I've heard against removal relate to um, senti the sentimental value, the paying tribute to the um, artist. And um, I also heard an argument that um, it's, not an, it's not meant to be offensive. And, and um, from my perspective, we can pay tribute to the artist in other ways. And you know, if you're not a member of um, the the class um, that's being discriminated against, you know, I don't think that you can decide what what's offensive or not. And um, after having heard from that class of people that it is um, offensive, I I just don't see any. Um, humane ju or just alternative and and I support what I think is is right um, so I'm glad you reached that conclusion and thank you for that um, I echo everything that everyone has said tonight um, and I'm happy to um, support you on this decision Sandy and thank you for bringing it to us and I promise that you know we are not going to be um, making these sorts of decisions on a regular basis, um, but I am more than happy right now to, oh, Kristen, I am so sorry. Okay. I didn't have, I didn't have much to add other than you have my support and I appreciate the historical context that Nick offered and I, as a not being from here, I'm not, I would have been as effective maybe in some of the conversations you've had and I just appreciate the background but I do support the removal of it. 
Um, so with that said, Sandy, I am very happy to motion to approve that the painting be removed. So moved. Second. And I think we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan. Yes, absolutely remove it. Ms. Giftos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Ms. Scyther. Yes. Mrs. Turner. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Motion passes. Um, I need to swap headsets really quick and I'm gonna see if this will work. All right, it didn't like that, so I may or may not cut out. Um, 7.5 is in-person school board meetings. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, I think I'm in now. Um, it did not reconnect, so if I drop off, it's because I don't have um, sound. Um, 7.5 is in-person school board meetings. We need to discuss about our coming back um, into public sessions. Do you want a motion, Leanne, before we have discussion? Yes, please. <laughs> Is now everyone waiting on me to make the motion? I, I don't know how to make it enough. Uh, I don't have anything in front of me. Um, Move to um, resume in-person school board meetings starting at the next scheduled board meeting. So moved. Second. Discussion. So, Nick, go ahead. Okay, so um, obviously this is bigger than just, hey, welcome back. Um, because I, I looked at the, on the state website, there's a whole, and I sent it to everybody actually at one point, there's a whole piece about town meetings and what that looks like. And I know there's been a lot of discussion nationally about school boards and meeting virtually. And, and I've seen some well-crafted, but pretty snide comments about how can you continue to meet remotely if you're gonna be putting students back in school. If we're going to resume meeting in person, we are gonna to have to discuss and decide on all the different PPE we're gonna put in place for ourselves. And does that mean all seven of us are actually what, there's nine that sit at that table. I don't think we can sit nine people at that dais. So that's gonna to have to look very different or, or some of us remote or some of us in a different room. You put dividers between people. I mean, town council's looking at this too, right? So I'm interested to see what they do. But um, obviously, if there's a way for us to gather in person that's safe, I want us to be able to do that. But I also want to respect anybody among us that has special health concerns, either in themselves or in a family member that would be putting someone at risk by doing that. And I want to be completely accommodating of those. I, I personally don't have that issue, but if there are members of this group that fit into that boat, I hope everyone feels comfortable voicing that and continuing to, to take the precautions they need to take. So it's a big, it's a, it's a big discussion, I think. Thanks, Nick. I can't see the hand raised. So uh, Max, why don't you go ahead next? So there are actually 10 of us, if you count me. Uh, just putting it out there. Um, but I would love to meet in person. I can't really make that decision for everyone. But like, I do have some health issues, but I am willing to meet in person. So just putting it out there. Thanks, Max. Kristen? Um, I'm, I'm also 
okay meeting in person. I like Nick would like to know what that's going to look like. And I, I think I also wonder, I know that the restrictions are going up to a hundred, but how is that piece of it going to be handled? How, you know, is someone going to be there enforcing that the members of the public are wearing masks or is that going to be a requirement? How are we going to handle, you know, the microphones, the ones that we use and the ones that public speakers will use? Alicia? Have we talked to anybody from IT to find out if we can still um, have the Zoom capacity as well in the event that we exceed 50 or 100 people? Diane, it looks like Diane knows that. Yeah, so I can weigh in on that. Um, I know that I've been talking with Don Beijing from IT um, and we're looking to contract with ProAV. Um, to make it possible for us to be live, but then also still have a Zoom component. And so that wouldn't necessarily just hold true for the current time, but is, you know, something that we, a practice that we could follow moving forward. Thank you. And, and then I was also wondering if there, if we have the capacity to hold meetings in a different location where we have more of an opportunity to socially distance Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Like the Wentworth cafeteria would be awesome because we, we could have our everybody spread out. I I do have a couple of concerns. Um, I, on a personal level, my bubble is very very small. Um, I do everything I can to protect my dad. Um, so the idea of going to in-person me meetings and having potentially, you know, that exposure at town hall is not my favorite idea. Um, I also understand, you know, people are going to be making decisions, personal decisions about sending their kids back to school. Um, and so I would probably be, um, the member of the board. Well, I, and this is an assumption and I shouldn't make assumptions. I, I'm not super comfortable going back to in-person meetings um but i would consider it if the proper precautions were in place and we could maintain social distancing and and people were wearing masks and i had confidence that the microphones were um you know being appropriately cleaned and all of those kinds of component issues that are not our job to figure out logistically um and then my other concern is about if we had to have an executive session um, what that space looks like, um, because those meetings need to be private, but a lot of the spaces we're talking about are fairly large and not private. Um, so that would be something else I would need to take into consideration. I am back. I had to come in in a different direction. Um, I echo a lot of what April said. I do have some concerns about coming back in, um, wanting to make sure that we can be adequately spaced. Um, it would also be contingent on, I think to me, where we are as far as a district. If we are not allowing all of our students into our room, should we consider not allowing all of the board members into our room? Um, really just following that suit. Um, I also have some like family situation where I've been really good and very cautious um, those are all pieces that I need to weigh in as well, um, whether or not I'm ready to give one for the other. Um, so it would really, to April's point, I want to make sure that we've got that distancing in place and totally would understand um, anyone on the board who was uncomfortable with being in person. And I'm going to hope that we can remain utilizing Zoom and YouTube. I think the participation has gone up tremendously. I don't want to lose that. And I apologize if I've said things that other people have. Hillary? Um, I think that, you know, April made a good point. Um, you know, we're giving our students the opportunity to go in a hybrid model, but also the choice 
to stay home. Um, and I think that might be the direction that the board should follow because, you know, while, while I might be comfortable going in person, you know, yesterday, today, my kid's getting tested for COVID and I wouldn't be able to go in person if we had a meeting tonight. Um, so we need to be able to accommodate um, people who might not be comfortable because of their family situation, but also people who can't go either because they're quarantined or um, or sick, and um, and I I I think that we just need to make sure that if that is the case where there are some people in person and some people over Zoom that that interface is able to to work however that however that might work nick you're muted nick you're on mute you're muted <laughs> that's such a great introduction to no um so we have one meeting scheduled in august right mm -hmm. It sounds like hearing everybody talk, and we're gonna learn a lot in the next 24 hours. We're gonna have the first designation from the governor about what she recommends by county for the schools to reopen. We're gonna have a, at least one refresh of that before our next school board meeting. I would propose that we consider keeping our next meeting, our August meeting in this format. And if we're gonna go live, we look at doing it at our first September meeting, because I think we're gonna learn a lot between now and then, not to mention, this whole thing could change so much in the next month. Who knows what it'll look like in, in September. So I don't feel like, I guess I don't feel like after hearing everyone else talk and, and, and I know I spoke first, but after hearing everyone else as well, I don't know that we're ready to, to make that determination to go in person yet. I, I think if we only have one meeting in August, we keep it here and we look at going in person in September when we're gonna learn a little bit more and we'll know more about what our schools are gonna look like as well. Thank you. Great point. Sarah? Um, I actually, as comfortable as I am right now, sitting in my yoga pants, and as much as I have enjoyed, like, the, and, and I think we've benefited from this, this format has benefited from engagement. Uh, we have a ton more engagement. We had 170 people watching on YouTube. That's more than any other meeting at Loud in person. I do think we need to figure out a way to maintain that. Um, I also, I guess I'll, I'll take a different approach, Nick, to the August meeting in that I think people are going to be looking for leadership and looking for people to make them feel comfortable. And if we're going to be asking our kids to go back to school in September, then I think we need to show them that we're comfortable doing it. And it doesn't have to be everybody. I think it can be a hybrid model, um, but we have to practice what we preach. And so I would like to, I would, I, I would, be in favor of having that August meeting in some capacity in person. Thank you. Kristen? Can we get sometime soon? Like, I don't know who's even responsible for setting up a safe environment. Who, who's gonna, like, is town council already working on what that looks like? They are. My understanding is their April meeting, uh, August meeting is in person. So they'll already have it figured out. Can they share with us what, what what precautions they're taking and how they're handling public comment and all that stuff? Sure, I can get that information. just seems pretty I mean I, I'm okay with doing it I just feel like it seems premature that we don't have any of the details worked out but that's the same thing that we're asking for for the students right we have we, we have a direction and there's still some details to work out so we have a direction and we'll figure out the details and if we can't figure out the details then we then we act it yeah. you know That's fair, Sarah. I think um, I just will reiterate that we're giving parents and families the choice. And so this idea that we're the practice what we preach 
um, you know, I voted to approve the plan for the return to school, but I don't know that I'll send my kids back to school. Um, and so I don't feel like I have to show up at a public meeting to prove myself. And I know you don't mean it like aggressively. I just. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, you know, we have to have, we have to have a framework that allows people to be remote for a variety of reasons, whether it's just personal or like in Hillary's situation, she's quarantined. You know, we can't, we have to tech, we have to figure it out uh, logistically and technologically. So that's all I'm at. Sure. Okay. Um, I think you brought up a great point right there, Sarah, about what we're asking. Um, I would counter just a small amount with, we know that we've got weeks ahead before um, staff and students are in the room. Um, but you're right, leadership does need to come into play. Um, so lots to think about in the next like 30 seconds. Um, I'm just gonna ask a technical question of Sandy and Diane. Do we actually need to make a motion to move back or is this something that we get the details and then when we go to post for our meeting in August, we're able to state that it is an in public meeting? I think as long as you put it out there to the public that you're making a change and the date of when the change is going to be, as long as you communicate that even a couple of times, I think that's all, that's good enough. Okay. Um, and again, I apologize if this was talked about in the beginning. This isn't an either or, like we can still have people joining us via Zoom. I mean, we know that the board members will, but the community is still going to have that and they're still going to have the YouTube connection to us. None of that changes, correct? That's correct. Because we are, like I said, we're partnering with ProAB to make some changes to council chambers um, and incurring the cost for that. Okay. Um, are we splitting that with council or is that? Um, for I I think that uh, we have not approached them to split it with us to date. Here, here's my little thief here, sorry. Um, <laughs> I promise I won't bring her to the in-person meeting so that she can bark um, in council chambers. Um, but um, in our discussions to date about that, um, we have received some CRF, some pretty significant CRF funds um, for COVID related expenses. And um, this is an allowable expense um, within that. Uh, so we had talked about recognizing that the council um, had really extended themselves to be understanding of the situation with COVID during all of the budget process and that um, perhaps we could incur that. It's about $15,000 total for a permanent upgrade that would allow us to have this um, live streaming capability and this Zoom capability from here forward, not just as a temporary solution. Um, to Kristen's earlier point, I will make sure that I get details um, with respect to the cleaning and the distancing, so we'll have that. Um, any other comments? Sarah, your hand is up, so I wasn't sure if you had something else. No, sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Bringing in Item 7.6 and 7.7, .7, it is and there's a approval of the- We need we have to vote. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's April, okay, you, you, were, that you were in and out. I wasn't there. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, so Alicia motioned um, that we uh, go into in-person meetings beginning at our August meeting. 
Um, and so it sounds like we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan. I, I guess I just wanna clarify that it's an optional in-person meeting. Is that correct? That's what was discussed, but I don't know. Is that how the motion's worded? Didn't yeah. we just decide we didn't have to vote on this? Yeah, I know but there's, there's a motion. motion. I know there's a motion, but we could we could at, we could pull it the motion. We didn't have to vote on the mural either. <laughs> yeah, but okay, <laughs> we didn't vote to leave. We didn't vote to go to vote. We're voting to go back. Okay, so just somebody take the motion away then. Can we do that? I think April, you actually made the motion. No, you did, Alicia. No, I you did. did. <laughs> yeah, Alicia, you did, honey. She said the words, but you made the actual Yeah, motion. I said it, but you moved it. You said Oh, you're oh. right. I moved the motion. Okay. I think you uh, can just table it, April, because that actually well, means kill it. That's what I was thinking. So I I move to table the motion to return to in-person meetings. Second. Second. Discussion. Okay, Diane, I think we're ready to vote on Wait, the sorry, tabling. Just, so the reason oh. we tabled it is because we actually don't need a motion if we decide to I just want to make sure everyone's clear. If we decide to go to in-person meetings, even in this next one in August, we would just make that decision and publicize it. It doesn't need to be voted on. Okay, got it. Are we ready? Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? I, he may have left us. <laughs> I can't understand why. <laughs> the fifth hour just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. Um, all right. I think we're good to move on. So 7.6, 7 7.7, 7 .7, um, motion to approve the meeting minutes of June 18th, 2020 and June 25th, 2020 as presented. Second. Second. And Diane, we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Um, 7.8, our appointment. Sandy, do we want to do all of them as one, or do you want to vote on each one after they're presented? What's your typical practice? Um, it can Depends go on what direction. time it is. <laughs> She's so true. <laughs> if it's after 10. <laughs> oh, welcome to the district. Go ahead, it's presented. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we can talk about each person and then just take a vote. Yep, that's fine. So, okay. Yes, please. Okay, we have a yep. language pathologist. Amy Chang has been chosen to fill this position by creating a re resignation. Ms. Chang received a BS degree in developmental psychology from Boston College and a Master's of Arts degree in, <clears throat> on speech language pathology from George Washington University. She has worked as a speech language pathologist since 2012 in several different facilities, including the Maine Educational Center for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Southern Maine Children's Collaborative, Cape Elizabeth School Department and South Portland School Department. Ms. Chain will be placed on step 10 of the master scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Amy Chain as a speech language pathologist. Second position is a point eight district wide psychologist. Jennifer Hilliard has been selected to fill this position created by a resignation. Ms. Hilliard earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology from the College of Charleston 
and her master's degree in psychology from the Citadel Graduate College. She has worked as, worked as a school psychologist in Malden, Mass, Somerville, South Carolina, and Charleston, South Carolina. Ms. Hilliard will be placed on step six of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Jennifer Hilliard as a 0.8 district-wide psychologist. The next position is a speech language pathologist assistant. Megan Bailey has been nominated to fill this newly created position. Ms. Bailey received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Sciences and Disorders from the University of Maine and her Master's of Arts degree in Special Ed from the University of Southern Maine. She has been employed at the Margaret Murphy Center for Children in both Auburn and Saco since 2010. Most recently, she was a speech language assistant in the Saco facility. Ms. Bailey will be placed on step eight of the master's scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Megan Bailey as the speech language pathologist assistant. We have a high school Spanish teacher position. Teresa Quinn has been chosen to fill this position that was created due to the completion of a one year contract. Ms. Quinn received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Spanish from Assumption College and her master's degree in instructional leadership from the University of Maine and her master's in Spanish literature from St. Louis University in Madrid, Spain. She was a Spanish teacher in Brunswick Junior High School for seven years before trans transitioning to a Spanish teacher at Chevers High School for the last 24 years, where she was also the department chair. Ms. Quinn will be placed on step 31 of the bachelor plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Teresa Quinn as a high school Spanish teacher. We have a second year probationary pro professionals. The following professional staff have successfully completed their first year of classroom teaching and can be moved to a second year status. Angela Keaton, Wentworth School, third grade teacher. Ashley Valentine, Middle School Academic Center teacher. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, motion to approve the appointments as presented. So moved. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Congratulations and welcome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Believe we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes, and welcome to the district. Ms. Layton? Yes. Ms. Yep. Sala? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. There we go. Excellent. And it passes. All right. Last, but most certainly not least, um, thank you everyone for a marathon session tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> Second. And we can just go to vote. Ms. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giptos. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Sider. Yes. And Mrs. Turner. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys, for all your Thanks, hard work. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.